welcome to today's city council meeting. We're grateful to have you join us. As you probably have seen, we've been holding electronic meetings due to ongoing practices of social distancing. Today, we would guess that many people would be interested in the events over the past weekend. That topic will be addressed in a few agenda discussions. Our second item is a briefing with the mayor and police chief to get an update about the curfew, protests, and community conversation, conversations over issues of systemic injustice. We know that many people have comments about these topics and we want to also make sure um, to show, excuse me, we all, want to make sure to share how to make the practice in the council's meetings while we are meeting remotely. Although conducting our meetings electronically is different from our formal in-person meetings, this is still considered an open and public meeting. We welcome members of the public who may be watching or uh, who uh, during our, our usual video feeds on the council's agenda page, on our YouTube page, Salt Lake City Television or Facebook Live. There's no public comment during the work sessions. However, please join us at our 7 p.m. formal meeting tonight to share any comments that you have about the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget or any other agenda item. And of course, your feedback is always welcome. We've been receiving a lot of emails, letters, and phone calls, uh, particularly in the last couple days. Thank you for taking your time to share your comments with us. Anyone can reach us by mail at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114-5476, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or by calling our 24-hour phone comment line. The number for that is 801-535-7654. Also, since we're receiving more and more comments in writing, all written comments submitted to the City Council on any topic scheduled for today's agenda have already been shared with city council members and will be posted for the public to view on slccouncil.com. We'll now move on to our work session items. Our first item includes, um, let's see, um, an information, an update relating to the mayor's proclamations declaring local emergencies for COVID-19 and the March earthquake. Um, the items that we have asked the administration to address are what steps have been taken to address the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 in geographic areas hit harder by the virus, like, uh, like and not limited to Salt Lake City's west side. And then also questions about the exigency of the emergency declaration timeline and proposed next steps from the administration, separate times like timelines for COVID-19 and the earthquake and other situations that are being addressed as needed. I'll turn the time over to uh, Chief of Staff Rachel Otto for this briefing. Um, I just want to, uh, or Rachel, do you want to talk about why the mayor can't uh, join us right now? Are you going to, or do you want me to just mention that? Whatever you would prefer, Council Chair. Um, just want for members of the public tuning in, the mayor is. Um, not able to join us right now because she is in a policy group discussion with um, state legislators and members of the, uh, of the black community to discuss some of the um, current city policies relating to de-escalation and use of force. She will be joining us um, later for a discussion about the uh, about those issues and about the curfew that was um, put into place yesterday. So Rachel, if you wanna go ahead and talk to us about the other uh, exigent issues, the COVID and the earthquake, um, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks council chair and um, members of the city council for having some space on your agenda again today to, to discuss um, the current emergencies. And I have to say, it's really strange to be sitting here with you today without COVID really being kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, it's, it's kind of almost surreal, the number of things that I, I feel like we have been facing as a city and I know that the whole country has really been facing. So um, I am happy to, to give you a bit of an update, although not a lot has really happened in, in the um, COVID space um, that I have to report to you tonight, but a couple of things. Um, 
First, we had the opportunity last Wednesday after we met with you on Tuesday to speak with uh, Mayor Wilson and Gary Edwards from the Salt Lake County Health Department about what I think then you saw transpire over the past over last week, which was for Salt Lake City to remain um, categorized in the orange phase for now. Um, and I, I, I just want to report to you that we really felt a lot of support from the county and from the state on remaining in the orange phase for right now. And um, a great deal of just respect and concern around some of the zip codes that we're seeing in Salt Lake City where we just haven't seen the kind of stabilization or downward trend um, that I think we're all looking for. So I... That said, I know that I'm sure you all have been following the news and seeing the kind of the increased cases that we've been seeing for the past few days, which some are attributing to the Memorial Day holiday. Um, I have not gotten more specific local data from the county this week. Uh, I got it last Tuesday and forwarded it on to you, and I haven't gotten a new um, batch since then. So. Um, the county has, you know, added some things to their dashboard in terms of zip code tracking, and I hope that's helpful. Um, and I'm looking forward to having another conversation this week with County Health to just talk through with them what what the the public health professionals are seeing in terms of those trend lines and specific zip codes. I think I saw Councilmember Fowler raise her hand. Councilmember Fowler. Thank you, Rachel, and um, for a lot, all of the things. Thank you for all of the things is what I'm going to say first. Um, I, I know how hard you're working right now. Um, that said, I do have a couple of questions. Um, do I, you know, gotten a lot of calls from constituents, uh, mostly business owners and some large business owners wondering what the potential timeline might be. Uh, certainly we don't have a crystal ball because if we did, we might just skip 2020 altogether. Um, but we, um, if you could have an idea of some sort, or if, do you have an idea of any sort of timeline where we, would be opening up a little bit more. Thanks for the question. I don't, if the question, if the specific question is, do I have a timeline on when we may move into the yellow phase? I don't, I know that, you know, the current order extends through this Friday at midnight. And so um, that's why I'm anxious to have a conversation in the next day or so um, with the county to see if we may if, we, if we're in a better position to start um, talking about transitioning at that point. Um, I guess the second part of, of the question or the second way that I would answer it would be that, you know, again, there isn't a lot of difference in terms of business operations between orange and yellow. And so, you know, to the extent a private enterprise is asking you when they may do something different, I think if you look at the Utah leads together, you know, this version of the plan, there's not a lot of fundamental differences around operational things that businesses should be doing differently. If we go to yellow, businesses are as they have been um, free to be open and to be um, operating safely, safely for their, their patrons and their employees. Um, that isn't gonna fun change a lot with, with our move to yellow. Can I can I ask a quick follow up on that? It is specific to a question I got from a pretty large company that is wondering it's, they have over 500 employees. And so I, I don't know if that changes because they are such a large employer. They're trying to communicate with their 500 plus employees on, on that change a little bit um, and having it's kind of a hard time telling those employees how to go. So I, that, that was the specific question that I received today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the answer would, would be, be similar. I mean, a large employer is probably gonna have some difficulty or may, I don't know, not knowing the circumstances, um, operate in a way that is able to, you know, keep their employees socially distant from one another. But that has never been 
you know, regulated in that way by the state really from the inception of, of this, of these phases. Um, there haven't been, you know, companies of a certain size can operate and others cannot. So that, that kind of remains the same. And I think the advice is still the same from the public health professionals in terms of trying to stagger operations or shifts or that kind of interaction that it's, it's kind of the same story that we've been dealing with. Okay. And then if I can ask just one last question, sorry, Chris. You go ahead. Here. Um, I have still been receiving more complaints about Stratford Avenue and the closure. And I think people are wondering about a timeline there as well. I hesitate, I'm gonna get this wrong. Um, and so if, if Marsha or John or someone from CAN is on the line, they should chime in. But I believe the transportation has been getting the message out that we will be getting suites back to kind of their normal operations, either when Salt Lake goes green or June by June 30th, whichever is fast, whichever is sooner. So I'm happy to get back to you on that to make sure I got that right and that we're actually getting that message out in a way that the community is hearing it so that you can um, talk to your constituents about that. And I hope that that's, um, I hope that just having that timeline is, um, gives them some comfort and some satisfaction. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, council members. Other questions? Okay, uh, Rachel, I did that. Uh, did, were, did you finish the presentation that you wanted to give us? Or I know we paused for questions. I didn't know if I didn't want to cut you off if you have more. The last thing I would say is that um, you mentioned at the outset of kind of the question that we began talking about last week um, in terms of the equity and the response to, um, to certain areas of the city. And I think David Litvak tried to address some of that last week. We've had additional conversations, um, at least we did before this past weekend, around being able to come to the council with more complete proposals um, as to how we may, uh, how we would propose allocating some of the federal funding that we anticipate getting, some of the state, state funding that we anticipate getting um, over the next several months so that we can make sure that we're getting the council's input on, on those allocations and that we're addressing um, some of the inequities that I think we've seen come into sharper focus since the beginning of this emergency. So um, that's still really heavily on our minds. It's just been a few days of not focusing so much on COVID right now, um, but it's still, it's still you know, very present and it's it's not that we as an administration aren't focusing on it. It's just that in terms of what we have, I know that we've committed to continuing this conversation at the elected official level. And um, as I know that, you know, the mayor has been um, paying attention to the current emergency. So we're looking forward to continuing that conversation with you. Though. And I think that's all um, that you had specifically wanted to address tonight. I realize that's kind of a general update. And um, again, thanks for the time and always, always here and happy to answer other questions as they arise. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. Yeah, um, oh, yes. Uh, uh, Amanda from the City Council office. Uh, Council Chair, this is Amanda from the City Council office. I just wanted to briefly mention that due to some schedule changes, the update agenda order has been changed. Um, mm -hmm. Tentatively uh, to uh, after the local emergency update, there's a streets bond discussion and then fire department unresolved budget around 430 or so is when we anticipate the mayor and the chief will give an update on the curfew and community conversations. After that's budget amendment six and then Cindy Lou's interview for the city recorder position. Uh, this tentative change can be viewed if you look in the chat within Webex. Um, just for all to be aware. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. Um, so we will go now to, um, we'll skip to uh, agenda item number three, which is a resolution uh, regarding the general obligation bond series 2020 for street reconstruction. Um, with us for that, we have Kira Luke from the city council uh, office. We have Mariana Scott, the city treasurer, 
Matt Cassell, the city engineer, and Mary Beth Thompson, the uh, chief financial officer. Okay, I'll go ahead and kick us off. Good afternoon, Thank you. everybody. This is a proposal from the administration to issue the next round of street reconstruction bonds. Um, this bond was part of the Funding Our Future discussions where housing, transit, public safety, and street conditions were all identified as critical needs without sufficient ongoing funding sources. Um, one option identified to reconstruct the city streets was to offer a general obligation bond on the ballot for voters to consider. They ended up voting in favor of it. Um, just a little bit more background. A big point in favor of the general obligation bonds is the accountability that's legally embedded in that process. The city can only spend those funds for the purpose that was described on the ballot when voters approved it. In this case, that was street reconstruction. After receiving voter approval, the city has up to 10 years to issue the bonds for the 87 million that's authorized. They can spread the issuances out. That can help minimize impact on property taxes, as well as ensure that there are enough resources like the labor to do the work in the three years that are allotted to spend bond funds once they're issued. In this case, thanks to existing bonds being paid off, um, staff understands that this issuance should not impact property taxes. This is the second round and is for $20 million, 300,000. The major project plan with this funding is reconstruction of 300 West with several smaller streets receiving attention as well. I'll defer further details over to Marina Scott, the city treasurer. Thank you. Um, the administration is asking the city council to consider adoption of a bond resolution that would approve the issuance of 20 million 300,000 of general obligation bonds. Uh, this current proposed issuance is the second block of bonds, just as Kira mentioned. And um, the first block was issued last year in the amount of 20 million. Exhibit one included in the transmittal details street projects selected for this issuance. The current plan calls for the adoption of the bond resolution on July 7th and bonds to be sold on August 18th. When this transmittal was being prepared, the city's financial advisors estimated that we could anticipate a true interest cost around 2%. Since then, tax exempt yields continued to decrease. In the current market, the city may expect a lower rate. However, interest rates fluctuate and it is difficult to predict what is going to happen in August. Because of the high volatility in the market, the sale date might be postponed to capture the most beneficial rate for the city. This is all I have, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, council members? Okay. Um, I don't see, yeah, I don't see anybody's, oh, council member Dugan. So we have the first issue that went out last year, and we have Correct. three years to spend it. This one's going out this year, and we have three years to spend it. Correct. Correct. We're, are we concerned at all in spending the first obligation within that three years? And do we have the manpower and the resources to have both of them at the same going at the same time? I'll defer this question to Matthew Cassell, the city engineer. I believe he was in attendance. I am here. So the answer is we are on schedule currently with the first uh, issuance of bonds. Uh, the way we set the bond uh, up is that we wanted to issue it so that the bond projects associated with each issuance, we'd spend the money in the first two years. So if there is problems with any of the projects, we have a third year to make sure that we spend the money before they expire. And so we are still on target, but we've only been one year into the into the program, but we are on target. Thank you. Any other follow-up? Okay. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here, uh, Marina and Scott and Matt and um and Mary Beth, and thank you, Kara, for leading us through that discussion. We'll now go to agenda item number five, um, which is the fire department budget for fiscal year 2020-2021.
Um, leading our discussion or starting off our discussion, we have Jennifer Bruno, the uh, City Council Deputy Director. And um, once she gives an overview, she'll hand it off to uh, Chief Carl Lee, who is the Chief of the Fire Department. Thank you, Jennifer. Council members. Hi, Council members. Just a really quick overview before the Chief jumps in. The Fire Department um, is about a $42.7 million budget with 366 employees. Firefighters are stationed at 14 strategically located fire stations around the city, including the International Airport. Um, I would point you to um, the mission and vision statements on pages E44 and E45 of the budget book to get an overview of the mission of the fire department. But there's also a really great attachment um, to the staff report that's their strategic plan from 2020 to 2024. And the chief can probably speak more to that, but that also goes into the detail of the mission and values of the fire department. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Leap. Well, thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate that uh, nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't think the mayor was able to join us right now, but Chief of Staff Otto, uh, Chief Administrative Officer Schaefer, I think you're here with us, Council Executive Director Gus Jensen. Council Chair, I appreciate you having me. Uh, Mr. Wharton and the rest of the council, thanks for giving me a little bit of time. I'll give you a Kind of a brief overview of where we are on the fire department. I also have on the line with me, my financial analyst, uh, Clint Rasmussen. So if we have any technical questions about the budget, we can certainly bring him in. Uh, Jennifer, would you go to the first slide, please? Thank you, that one. That one. Okay, so just a, an overview of, really quick overview of who we are, how we fit into the city as far as, um, the budget, we have 356 total employees. Uh, we have an additional 10, 10 uh, unfunded employees in anticipation of uh, absences. Uh, the council has awarded, granted us that ability to, to up staff, so to speak, uh, to try and avoid uh, lengthy absenteeism in the department. We have 341 sworn positions, we have 15 civilians, and we have 57 fire department employees in support. So out of the 356, literally 300 of my employees are out in the field at the fire station. Okay, we are the fifth largest department in the city for FTEs, uh, if you use that qualifier. We have the lowest turnover um, per the 2020 annual report, we're about 3% turnover. So we're right in line with uh, IMS, I believe, and I think, uh, um, um, the council office as well, I think, has a pretty low turnover generally. But for the amount of employees that we have, it's exceedingly low. We're very proud of that. Um, the people are, the firefighters are obviously very happy to be firefighters and we don't see a lot of change. Um, in 2019, uh, the city did a, uh, hired a Y2 analytics company to do a uh, survey for resident satisfaction. And we came in number one, we're the highest rated uh, city service. So we're also very proud of that. And we have been for uh, many years, um, many years going now. So as far as our budget goes, as you see in the sheet, our budget, uh, 42,552,000. 94% of our budget goes towards personnel, which is not different than most of the departments in the city. 6% that remains, which is approximately 2.5 million, goes for merit, steps, and increases in pension costs and insurance. So that's kind of the overall look of the fire department budget. Jennifer, you go to the next slide, please. Okay, this gives you um, a kind of a 10,000 foot view of our run volume. Over the last four years, we've been pretty static as far as service demands in Salt Lake City. 2019, we saw 28,921 calls. And if you just drop down to 2016, we had a very similar number, 29,119 calls. Um, and they vary, very uh, minimally from fire to medical as well. So we've been pretty static in what the residents of Salt Lake City want to see from their fire department. Jennifer, next slide, please. Okay, here is a rundown of our COVID impact. Obviously the impact of COVID-19. We have uh, obviously invested some, some of our budget in PPE. We've had emergency responder pandemic leave. Uh, we've had uh, wipes, sanitizer, bleach, disinfectant for the stations, for the apparatus, um, and for just the coming and goings of our fire personnel at the uh, 
at the fire station. So it's been a significant cost as it, as it has been for many of the entities in Salt Lake. Um, specifically to our, our fiscal year 2021 budget, uh, we are, when, when the mayor's budget was, was proposed and decided, we had seven vacancies and one civilian position that was vacant. And that was our recruitment and outreach uh, individual, Darby Egbert. So she left uh, early part of the year. Uh, so that amounts to 272,000 savings uh, in vacancies. Uh, we're, we are not gonna be able to do a recruit school later in this year due to the hiring freeze. And given that we've lost our civilian recruitment and outreach coordinator, we're gonna be doing a little less recruitment, uh, but we are going to put those responsibilities on some of my, my other entities and community relations. We're gonna to continue to recruit and continue to diversify the department and look for the best qualified, most qualified um, candidates for a firefighter. We also are minus $100,000 for apparatus equipment this year, which would have amounted to two apparatus being fully equipped with new equipment. We will adapt. We will use equipment that is on reserves right now to, uh, to stock those new apparatus and we'll move forward. Um, at the current time, we since, since the budget was proposed, we have an additional five vacancies in the fire department. So right now we are up to 12 with, uh, with the one civilian. Uh, by the end of the year, I anticipate we'll have somewhere between 16 to 20 total vacancies in the fire department by the end of 2021. Jennifer, last slide, please. Okay, whether the budget is flat, whether we have revenue or whether we're short, these are the priorities for the fire department moving forward. We have a brand new strategic plan. I think each of you have been sent that plan. I don't know if you have an opportunity to look at it. These are the primary goals for the fire department moving forward in the next few years. So this is really kind of a, a short term and a longer term outlook. But goal number one, provide unparalleled public safety service. Um, instrumental to that is our dispatch uh, center. We work very closely with Lisa Burnett and her team. We look at the software we're using. Obviously priority dispatch has been in the discussion before with the council. We look at our response model. How can we become more efficient? How we become more nimble? make sure we have the right people in the right place throughout Salt Lake City. Um, goal number two, firefighter health and safety. This is a big one for us. I think the firefighters invest a lot in Salt Lake City. Obviously, we need to invest in the firefighters. There's a lot of stress, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of drug abuse, there's alcohol abuse, marital issues, money issues. Um, it's a lot. Um, it's similar to what we see in the police department and similar, obviously, to what we see in dispatch as well. So we're going to continue to emphasize peer support, mental health resources, and the, the, kind of, uh, the, kind of, the kind of facilities and the kind of personnel and expertise that can help our people come back to work, feel good about it, and be productive in Salt Lake. And if they can't, we want to, we want to know that they have a hand to get back there. Okay. Uh, and we're going to continue to improve workplace environment. We've got uh, two brand new stations, essentially. The remainder of our stations are in pretty good shape. We have a couple stations that are getting pretty old now and they are gonna need uh, some investment in the infrastructure and the buildings themselves. So, um, but I feel pretty good about where we are with that. Goal number three, department leadership, training and development. We're gonna continue to develop and expand an officer, develop pro officer development program. I want my supervisors that are in place now to train their replacement, essentially. We need to have a more tangible and more robust process for my firefighters to gain uh, more responsibility and to rise within the department. That's something we haven't had for many years and something I wanna dedicate resources to. Along with that, we're gonna emphasize continuing education and training opportunities. I am a big believer in advanced education. I want my firefighters to go to school Obviously, I'd like them to get their degrees, not just an associate's degree, but I'd like to see them get bachelor's degrees and beyond. The fire, the fire service is becoming more white collar all the time. It's not just uh, going on a fire and swinging from a rope with an ax, you know, and a baby in one hand and, and doing those kind of things. It's, it's, you have to understand the budget. You have to understand communication. You have to understand value. And we have to become more meaningful for residents and to the city all the time uh, because there's a trust factor there and it's, it's important for us to understand that. It's a much bigger it's a much bigger entity than just going on a fire and putting it out. And lastly, uh, our strategic plan emphasizes community risk reduction. 
I think we as a fire department are ready to have a larger uh, responsibility in public education, working with our emergency managers and right here at Salt Lake City Emergency Management with Pam Wafgren. I think uh, there's a role in there for us to help coordinate what happens, particularly with what we're seeing uh, this year. As we said, 2021 has just been an unbelievable year for very unique and challenging events. And I think there's a lot we can do yet to be uh, more in coordination with not only our partners in police, but Salt Lake City Management, SLC TV. I'd like to be able to communicate better with my community from the fire department. I think they, they sometimes just naturally look uh, to the police department for some of these things. They may not even be familiar at all with Salt Lake City Emergency Management, but I think they feel very comfortable in most cases with the fire department. And right now we just don't have that communication link with uh, the community on that kind of level. So I'd like, to, I'd like to definitely get there in the next few years. So that's where we're headed. I just wanna reassure uh, the council that I know these are difficult times for municipalities across the country. We understand that. I, I can certainly appreciate the mayor's commitment to everyone's jobs and their wage. Um, so this is going to be challenging. Moving forward, we're, we are going to be, uh, have difficulty with vacancies in the fire department. It's going to mean an increase in overtime. Um, of, of additional concern to me is burnout. We're going to be asking firefighters to work more often. Uh, they're going to be coming in and sometimes they don't know, you know when to stop. You, just, you can't just keep coming to the station and going on calls day after day. Of course, we have limits to how many hours they can work at one time, but uh, it's something we're gonna watch very carefully because when they, when they start to get burnt out and they start to get tired, that's when we start seeing people get hurt. So we're gonna be watching that uh, very closely. Um, other things, I think we're gonna see three-handed apparatus in the city this year. Um, most of you are familiar with our four-handed model. It's a priority for myself and, and my labor group. Um, we are one of the few departments in the city that is minimally staffed. So if I do not have 66 firefighters in the city, which makes us four-handed on every apparatus, I will ask people to come back and work and fill those positions on a daily basis. So during the summer, those demands can increase uh, significantly. And if I don't have um, a full staff or near a full staff in the department, those demands are gonna be more extreme. So we're gonna see a tipping point at some point this summer, usually because that's when the most vacation is being used, when people don't necessarily wanna come into work every day. Um, we're gonna see vacancies. We're gonna have engines and trucks that are running three-handed. And uh, there may be a point where I would consider sending some of my support firefighters that are sworn officers back into operations to try and take the edge off of that. But really we're just shifting one problem to another area because if I take support workers and put them into operations, something else is going to get dropped. And support in the fire department exists to make sure the firefighters and operations can go on those calls 24 7, 365 days a week. So um, we're just kind of, we'll just be kind of uh, chasing our tail for a little while. But we will make it work. We have done so before. We have operated with vacancies and uh, we'll make sure that Salt Lake City residents get the the most professional service that uh, that we can provide and what they're entitled to. So thank you. I'll take some questions now if you have some. Yes, thank you, Chief. Um, question from Council Member Dugan. Chief, you talked about the vacant, the current vacancies. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the brief. Appreciate it very much. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, very informative across the board. Uh, you talked about the six vacancies plus the one civilian currently and that would go through the, the fiscal year. And then you talked about losing up to another 10 people total to for 16 FTs. Is that part of the, your budget to have all 16 or would you look at uh, only having vacancies for six for the budget year? No, nope, that would be part of the budget council member. So um, at the end of this year, I would anticipate, as I said, 16 to 18 total vacancies. Those are all full-time employees that are budgeted but I'm unable to hire them right now during uh, during our extreme, you know, obviously conditions in the city. Right, and another question, just I'm following that, and the training, a recruitment class, how long is a class and how long is it 
to for a firefighter firefighter to be uh let's say fully qualified for us it's a six month period of time from beginning to end from the process we start hiring and interviewing to the end of recruit school which is 16 weeks it's approximately six months so and they're fully, okay. yeah then they're ready to hit the street they start an apprenticeship they start the apprenticeship and the, and the uh, success rate of school, I mean, do you have a uh, retention or how, how well do they get past the class? We do about 10%. We have about a 10% attrition rate in Firefighter Recruit Academy. Okay. That can vary up and down by an individual. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, other questions? Council Member Rogers. Hey, Chief. How's it going? Hey, Council Member. Good. Appreciate it. A um, couple questions for you. Camp Athena, Camp Apollo, are those going to be affected at all with the uh, cuts, or how is that looking? Good question. Right now, um, it's on hold right now, Council Member. We would like to have those late in the summer, maybe early in the fall, if we can push them back that late. I, I certainly want to have Camp Athena and Camp Prometheus because they're so popular. And that's right. so good for us, you know, just to, to tell our community what we're doing. But I don't know. The answer right now is I don't know. I'm hopeful, um, but I have to be realistic about it. We may not be able to, we may, may not be able to conduct those. Uh, and then my other question is, there's always been talk when we talk with the police department about uh, services rendered for the U of U or, you know, that type of thing, looking at uh, maybe cannibalizing the U of U police department or looking at those options. Um, what, how are our services towards the University of Utah? Do we have any idea how much time and effort is placed there? At the, currently, I don't know exactly how much time or effort, but I can give you an anecdotal idea that um, it's, not, it's not significant how much time we devote up there, but it is notable. So there is, there is some money that would be involved in the services we provide to the university, but we don't go up there so often or medical calls or fire calls that I believe it would be a, a significant uh, revenue source great. for the fire department. Yeah. Okay. But I can calculate those for you. That'd be great. That'd be worth looking into. Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. Uh, other questions, council members? Okay, um, uh, I can only see four council, oh, three council members right now. Oh, there's uh, council member Fowler. Do you have a question? Um, no, I just wanted to say hi to Chief Leap. <laughs> Hello, council member Fowler. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Chief. I, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you for uh, that presentation and all the great work that you're doing. And, um, thank you to you and your team for um, all that you did to um, uh, uh, the medical attention that you helped provide over the last weekend. So we really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I'll pass that along to my team. Thanks. Okay, let's move on to our agenda item number eight, which is unresolved budget issues for the 2020-2021 budget. Let me just scroll down to that. Okay, so um, Bruno from City Council Office is going to lead us through that. Um, available for questions, we've got pretty much everybody. Oh. Um, so, uh, uh, rather than read that whole thing, I'll just, uh, uh, let, um, Jennifer go ahead and start us off. Thank you. Yep. Um, so this is the second unresolved issues discussion. Um, if you look in your attachments, um, you'll notice that we've started tracking it in sort of like a spreadsheet form of additions and subtractions so that we can start having an eye towards balancing the budget, which is of course our ultimate goal for hopefully next week. Um, so staff actually um, sort of reprinted last week's unresolved issues staff report with any new information that was um, uh, that we received based on the council's questions last week. So all of that new information is in green in the staff report if you want to go through it. And maybe what I can do um, 
I, I don't know if it would be better to just quickly go through the new information or if it would be better to just kind of toggle to the to the spreadsheet and get to the business of, of starting to make some choices about what um, items you want to fund or not fund. Um, but of course, some of those decisions might be dependent on that new information. So um, yeah. what would can you prefer? We, can we just do a, a quick overview of the new information? And if you have questions yeah. about the new information, just hold those and then we'll go through this, the spreadsheet again. And then, yeah. Great. Thank so you. just to, just to scroll through it, we clarified that um, the judgment levy amount is actually a little bit higher than it was in the last version of the staff report. So we love it when changes go in that direction. It's actually 1.56 million instead of the 1.3. Um, the North Temple Viaduct Debt Service, we just um, clarified what council member preferences were on that. One council member expressing the interest of using uh, funding to address the evolving situation on North Temple. One council member expressing an interest to um, hold it in the general fund balance to depending on how a fiscal year 21 goes. So we can figure that out later. Um, we so if you scroll down to the bottom of page two, um, we will work on scheduling a policy discussion with the administration on how to direct future CARES Act funding. Um, this is a, a relatively new piece of information. We um, had um, uh, ben on our staff worked with finance to review all of the CIP line items that are older than three years old with a thinking that um, if a CIP project was approved a couple years ago and it hasn't moved or it has $15 sitting in it, which it literally is the case <laughs> in some cases, that those are dollars you can probably use. So these are the couch cushions. Um, and what uh, the total amounts to is that there's about $422,000 on to that the council could choose to recapture from 19 completed projects. So this is not projects that you would stop. These are just projects that are done that you can um, sort of scoop up the sort of remaining money um, in those accounts. It would be one time money. And um, you might want to think about if you would rather direct it towards additional CIP projects or if you would rather direct it towards uh, balancing the general fund budget, because obviously that's going to be a huge topic. This year. You could do either. Um, there is also, in addition to that 422, there's $250,000 sitting in an account from fiscal year 15 to um, implement a city daycare. And this is an idea that was really important to the council at the time um, and ha has actually been reinforced by recent councils as a, 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 a policy priority. Um, but the city just hasn't been able to find the right fit, um, especially for that kind of money. So you could decide, does it make sense to keep that money there, to keep your options open, keep looking, or um, since the um, funds haven't been spent, do you want to reconsider that? I would add another 250000 I don't know if there's questions on that. I can't see people's hands anymore because we're sharing the screen now. So... Yeah, I can't see anyone using the hand tool. Okay. Oh, oh. Councilman Johnson. <laughs> uh, this is just a procedural question. On the, um, the documents under unresolved issues, I think it only, there's one attachment in that folder and it's not this one. It's for the 4th well, Avenue well. Oh, um, my apologies. I will, I'll send you the latest version of the spreadsheet. Am I, am I off on that? Anybody else see the same thing or? In, uh, in A8, Unresolved Issues, when I open it up, it's the 4th Avenue Well document. That could just be a-, a That is an unresolved one. issue. It is an unresolved it's, issue. But there were, there were- Section. Oh. Yeah, there were probably five other attachments that needed to be um, attached to the staff report. So staff will make sure um, that those are uploaded for the public uh, a little later. But um, I just emailed it to you guys in your email. So if you want to open that up, that's where the spreadsheet will be, at least. I think it's um, okay my, the public because I'm looking at the public one right now. Okay. okay, thanks for clarifying that. Yep. So my apologies. It happens sometimes. Um, okay, so continuing to go through this, and Amanda, don't worry about sharing the spreadsheet yet because we're just going through the um, staff report. So I'll let you know when to share the spreadsheet. That'll probably be after this. Thank you. So <laughs> thanks, Amanda. 
So um, let's see, the next item uh, is um, just confirming that some council members indicated a preference to fund a litigator or legal secretary, and that um, some council members are, understand, are interested in understanding the relationship between the victim advocate and the prosecutor's office um, compared to the police department. Um, we're still working with the administration on what the budget figures of those um, items are. So, and I, I haven't seen any update from um, staff on the approach of the police department compared to um, the prosecutor's office, but email has also been a little nuts the last few days. So um, budget staff, feel free to chime in if there's something that I've missed in the last day. I don't see anyone chiming in. So. Um, we have um, clarified some budget figures on what it would take to add various levels of planning staff. Um, if you're interested in adding planning staff to help with the workload there, and that's um, in the updated version of the spreadsheet. Um, we are, we've inquired with the administration if there's any unallocated ACE funds that are left. Um, I haven't heard back yet on that, but that's an open question. And that's uh, in order to help with excuse me, with funding the in-between. Um, one concept was raised for the transportation dollars is to put those in a holding account um, to have the administration come back and go through what the process is that they went through to allocate those funds um, and make sure that the council is comfortable with those funds before um, those are released. The other thing that the council could do is um, also consider a legislative intent on this topic so that the administration knows how you prefer they handle this um, in future fiscal years. Obviously, it's still up to the administration, you know, how the, how the funds get um, decided, uh, or at least how they get recommended, but um, it sometimes helps them to understand what your policy preference is, what kind of information you would need before you feel comfortable um, approving the dollars. Does that make sense? Um, we're still working with the administration on the logistics of carrying out the um, council's intent to transfer the revolving housing trust fund dollars for development. It's possible that we can actually just do it by motion and then that would automatically transfer all of the um, loans and repayments to be managed by the RDA. We're just working out the, the weeds of it. And then in budget amendment number six, the council will have more information about the um, administration's proposal and sort of an alternate um, funding source for that proposal. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the, let's see, the uh, council members have indicated that it's a high priority to address um, homeless service needs, either through CAN or the public services budget. So we've actually, on the spreadsheet, you'll see that we've listed it in both places. In the CAN budget, it's probably more of the um, operational support type um, allocations. And in the public services budget, it's probably more of the camp cleanup, uh, parks cleanup kinds of um, uh, services. So um, that's just one thing to consider as we get there. We don't have exact amounts because in our thinking, this is more of a placeholder for potential unknown future needs. Um, we just received today information on the new housing programs that are being proposed by the administration. They, you could actually kind of think about them in both the annual budget uh, process as well as the budget amendment number six process because some of the housing programs are referenced in both. So, for example, the rental and mortgage assistance program. So I know um, Lonnie is prepared to address those, but it might... I don't know if it makes sense to address them here or if you would rather address them in budget amendment number six where it's a little more like time sensitive, but either way, either both. <laughs> I don't know if, let's oh, see, does James? Oh, sorry, let me see. Uh, any questions, anyone? I couldn't tell if James had a question or if he's just, okay, I guess not. Uh, oh, Andrew has a question. Yeah, <laughs> Could I clarify one part of that, of those, the list of things, the planning um, staff one? Uh, I know in our previous uh, council meetings, Nick Norris, when asked about um, planning staff resource and if they need more staff to do, um, well, to, to look at the entire city zoning and bring it up to date, what we've been talking about for a number of, of months and years. Um, he indicated, I think the mayor said this as well, that 
They don't believe they need more staff. They could reorganize certain um, things in their department to get sufficient staff to do this. I just want some confirmation if that's happening and um, if that is going to come to fruition, I guess, sooner. The reason I say that is because if we need to add planning staff, now is probably the time to do it, um, especially if we can get a jump start on this so that if the economy rebounds two years from now, um, we are in a better place to grapple with that growth in a planning way for the city. Um, so I'm not saying we have to add planning staff without their needing it. I just need some confirmation that they're They've alluded to this plan, but we haven't heard anything about it detail wise, but it's actually in process and uh, they don't need an allocation for our staff. Okay, we will we will um, work with the administration to confirm that. Oh, there's Marsha. Maybe Marsha can answer. Sorry about that. I was just kind of my bandwidth gets a little wonky here. Thanks for that question, Council Member. Um, we are in the process of reorganizing our planning staff and looking at those items that um, would be typically um, uh, by ordinance, uh, just uh, non, oh, I'm losing the, the word, sorry, um, that they would just normally go through without having a conditional uh, look. Um, and so we are in the process of that. Um, we do have uh, an extremely high capacity of planning permits that are going out right now. I think, I don't know if you've seen, uh, we're ahead of last year's uh, amount, even though we are, um, as far as permits, as, as even though we, we, we've seen a slowdown in the last few weeks, but uh, I think that's picking up as well. Um, I would say that uh, given the, the opportunity to look at zoning and some of the ordinances and look at reorganizing some of those that, uh, yes, if, if you wanted to uh, fund another planner, we would definitely feel that that would be well utilized within that planning division. So I don't know if I answered that question okay, and I'm sure that uh, we've got Michaela on the line as well, so uh, she can answer that as well. Council Member uh, Lano. Yeah, just to add to that um, conversation, I know we'd also talked about potentially rather than hiring a staff member, potentially bringing in an outside consultant for something such as like the height study of all of the downtown area or some of those like very large efforts, but that are kind of one time efforts. Um, so I would want some clarification as to whether if we assuming there is additional money which we don't know if there is but if there were is it better to be used to hire an in-house staff member or to to fund a study like that what would be the bigger bang for the, the buck we can we can definitely follow up with um i mean nick would probably be best i'm guessing to address that marcia is that right that would be true. I think um, that we also have plans to meet um, with council staff and even maybe in small groups to to discuss this very issue. So I don't I don't want to get out. I know that we're right in the middle of the budget and it'd be a perfect time, but I don't want to get out too far ahead of a, a you know a good study or a good analysis of of, of the department. And and we could follow up on Nick with Nick based on um, the previous discussions that we've had. I know that sometimes when you hire consultants, it doesn't necessarily alleviate all the workload for in-house staff since there's still a lot of obviously coordination that needs to take place with the, the in-house. But we'll follow up with him to get some of that. And this is Michaela here. That's definitely been an issue with uh, planning staff and our use of consultants in the past. Um, the resource to either fix or rewrite um, what the consultants have done. We been incredibly successful um, in house doing that work. Um, Council Member Fowler. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Oh, Rachel is still here. Okay. Um, I'm wondering as to sort of Andrew's question about looking at our, our zoning and ordinances in that way, where the 
I know that we have, the administration has talked about, and last year we funded, so, uh, well, we put it in our savings account fund or whatever we, the set aside for um, an equity director or somebody to look at equity. I think part of the issue and part of the reasons I would be interested in looking at our zoning is for the systemic racism that is in, is in zoning generally. And this seems like it would be a good space to use that equity person that we've been talking about hiring or maybe has been hired to help inform how we're looking at our zoning practices um, and our general zone. So zoning issues, right? So I guess, I don't know if that's a question or, or a statement or something, but. I could just share a little information based on um, our staff had a question about that position in particular because we weren't sure the status of it based on it is included in the mayor's recommended budget, but it is also um, like other unfilled positions subject to the hiring freeze. So only six months of the position is included in the mayor's recommended budget. When we asked about it, I think that and Rachel would probably be in a better position to talk about this, but that they were hopeful that the equity plan that was funded by the council in the last budget amendment would kind of set the stage for this person. And so you almost needed one before the other. Um, but I don't know um, if Rachel wants to, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Mr. Chair, do you want me to? Yes, please go okay. ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Jennifer. You, I think you pretty much said it. Um, yeah, I know this position has been kind of hanging around for a little while. Um, and I know that it's it's kind of one of those things where it's it sounds like this really good idea but we don't we want to make sure that we're really thoughtful about this kind of a hire and we're i think just as a city especially just through you know the covid crisis where we're um you know more more sharply focusing on different inequities we just want to be very thoughtful about this which is part of the reason we came to you and um and asked for your support with with allocating some money to the equity plan and as we continue to sort of uh, unload all of this stuff and parse through it, we there there are just we have we have some vision around you know what the Human Rights Commission could be and what how we can make sure that we are looking at every every process and function and allocation in the city in the most equitable manner. And so that's my long-winded way of saying that I think there's a lot of potential for this position, and I'd like to. I'd like to keep it, um, it, it with the acknowledgement that it may be reshaped and reformed into um, something bigger, something different, something that's a little bit more responsive to the time we're in now than, than the time we were in when, when the council allocated this position last time. Okay, thank you, um, Council Member Valdemoros. Thanks, Rachel. So, and then on the second thing that Jennifer mentioned, the uh, the study or the plan, the equity plan. What's the status of that? Thanks for asking. Um, this is something that David Litvak and Selena Milner in our office have been working really hard on, and have been meeting with Mary Beth and her staff in terms of getting getting an RFP out there. There's a and putting that initial framework into place. That said, we're really committed to putting a draft or a framework of the RFP out to the community and making sure that we're engaging the community in what, you know, our start on what we think the outcomes of the RFP or what, what we think the outcomes of the study should be. So we'll be kind of shopping that draft of the RFP around with maybe our, our initial sketch of what those outcomes might be, you know, through the Human Rights Commission through different community groups and um, to make sure that we're we're really getting the community invested in what this plan could look like. So that's where we are. We have an RFP kind of drafted, but we're gonna start that community engagement piece next. Okay, thanks so much. Um, other questions? Councilmember Johnston and then Councilmember Fowler after that. Yeah, I, just a, um, my previous statement about wanting to know if uh, planning has the bandwidth and staff they need to do this. It, 
it, it comes from what I think most of the council members are saying now that um, our housing plan, our transportation plan, our parks and outdoor space plan, um, our shared amenities throughout the city, um, the, all those equity issues are going to come down a lot of it to our planning ahead for it. Uh, and we're not quite ready for that at this point. And that's where I was, if planning has enough staff to be able to, to get a jump on that now or the economy rebounds or as it does, hopefully soon, um, we're going to be in a better place to be able to use the resources in the right place, regardless of the equity plan we've got. I'm concerned that we don't have that at this point. And so, um, like I said before, if, if Nick and, and his team feel like they have the bandwidth they need to do this, uh, from Sugar House to Ninth South, which we've had a few months ago, a rezone uh, request, uh, to clearly the um, station center request, the UTA and the other developers. Um, all of those are part of this for me. And that's where I'm coming from. I'm trying to say I, it's a tight budget and there's so many needs. Um, investment in a position or two, if needed for planning, I think would pay off long-term in all these areas for us. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnston. Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. So this is um, not on this particular subject, but I did want to sort of flag, um, if we can, for a further policy discussion. It's not something anytime soon, but Jen mentioned the sort of couch cushions of that three-year CAIP report. I would be interested, after budget season is over and we're you know, somewhere down the future a little bit in looking at a policy where we kind of just require that three year recapture or at least look at, and maybe we have it and I just didn't know that we had it. Yes. Um, we do have it. We do, we do. Um, and Ben can chime in with the specifics of it, but that was included in um, the last, I want to say it was the council policy on CIP. So the council adopted a revised policy on CIP that included. Last yeah. year? Um, ben, was it two years ago? It was in 2017, actually. 2017. Uh, there is a capital and debt management resolution that guides the city's use of debt, repayment of debt, and CIP projects. And the council did a deep dive and updated several sections of that resolution. Uh, it's attachment one to the CIP staff report, and I'm happy to send it if you wanna take another look. And that's what requires a look at old CIP accounts. And the council identified three years as kind of a reasonable, if we haven't gotten the project off the ground and made significant progress in three years, Maybe there's not enough funding and we should look at it again, or maybe there's other obstacles that would require a relook and maybe the funding could be used somewhere else better. So we also have the reporting ordinance that requires a report on all of the capital accounts. And that's what I looked at with finance to determine what projects are completed and what funds still exist. So we have that built in mechanism each year with the annual budget for staff to receive that report from finance and take a look. So there's 435,000, is that what you said, Jen? 422. Of one time money. Yeah. And those are all projects that were three years or older. Three years or older and completed. Oh wow! Okay. So on top of that, on top of that, was that two hundred fifty for the daycare? Yes. Yes, that's in addition to. So. Okay. Sorry, the wheels are turning. Like I'm sure everybody's are. That's what these discussions are for. Councilmember yeah. Mono. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. Was I was sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Councilmember Johnston. Yeah, another thing we could look at in lieu of adding positions, we could unfreeze some current positions. Um, it's it doesn't add long term capacity, but short term it may fill capacity. But it's another option we could look at. And that is one of the options that we listed in the um, attorney's office specifically because that came up in the um, attorney's office budget discussion, but I think the same would be true in any department, right? The vacancies. So across the city, 
there's six months of vacancy savings that have been captured. And I think the extent to which departments can fill those vacancies would help them, you know, with that capacity. Any other Thanks. questions or comments, council members? Okay, I don't see any. Sorry, sorry, I yes. pressed the wrong buttons. Councilmember Fowler. Um, so, you know, with that being said, I think for me, just so it's out there, one of the priorities, um, as I'm sure it doesn't surprise most of you that have been on the council with me for three years, um, as the fire department, <laughs> I certainly worry, James is making fun of me right now, it's the only reason I'm laughing. Um, I worry about having 20 vacancies by the, by the end of this year. But the firefighters that are working and are available on a pretty big strain because they do work really hard to keep that four person team because it's a safety protocol. Right. And so um, I, I think that's just something I want to put out there as a priority of mine, that if, if we do it for some departments and and maybe kind of think about it in that way, then I'd like to put that as a priority for me. And I don't know how other people feel, but it, it's a safety issue, not just for our firefighters, clearly, but for our residents. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have one more question, uh, just for a clarification. Council Member so Morales. Leftover money that we're talking about, which came from CIP, can we use it for other things that are not CIP related? Yes. Like, yeah, because it was originally general fund dollars. Okay. Got but the, the important thing to remember is that it's one time money. So, um, to the extent that you use it to fund something that's ongoing, like, for example, staffing in the fire department, that adds to your structural deficit for next year, which I think is just where we are in this budget. Okay, so we will add that to keep track. And then I think we were at... Jennifer, could I add one thing? Yes. Um, this is Cindy Gus Jensen. Uh, in, in answer to Councilmember Baldemoros' question, um, usually... Once money is in CIP, you would try to leave it there as opposed, you, you certainly can move it out for another purpose, but you uh, typically would do your best to leave it there because it's already so significantly underfunded. But again, no obligation. So the next um, new item, so we can go over the housing programs. I think we started on that when we were talking about the housing programs where you can either talk about it here or in budget amendment number six. Maybe it's better to just talk about it in budget amendment number six. Um, then <clears throat> we received some um, information from building permit review. I think we talked about it last week about the very positive reviews that they've been getting about having fire plan review um, located with building services. So we just included that information in the staff report. Um, for the police department, um, some council members have expressed interest in funding additional de-escalation training and requested a future briefing um, from the police on how they would deploy additional funding if the council gave it to them. Um, and then the council has been tracking a number of policy issues um, that have been raised by council members and um, is working to get a better understanding um, from the administration of how these funds could be used and what kinds of um, uh, framing of those funds. I, I think that it probably is better to wait for um, when the chief is on the line to discuss some of these things. I think that they're planning on, he and the mayor are both planning on joining the council meeting at about 4.30. So we have it as a placeholder in the annual budget. If as a result of that conversation, you decide it makes sense to allocate some funds in the budget, because um, that's certainly an option in this uh, budget. Um, and then one, one thing we wanted to mention, um, since we've been getting lots of public comment about 
defunding the police. Um, staff just confirmed that um, state law actually does require a city to have a police department. And so there's just certain logistical things that state law requires us to do. And um, having a police department is one of those things. I, I don't know if council members are interested in that, but there were a lot of <laughs> lots of comment today about it. So we just thought we'd just double check with the attorney's office and they pointed us to that state. Uh, I don't know if there were any other police questions or if we'll maybe save them for when the, the chief is on the line. Uh, I think we probably save them. Okay. okay. Um, then uh, public services, we um, have put together a, a legislative intent for the council to consider about public services. If you want to look at that, we will have the legislative intents briefing. We we're supposed to have it tonight, but we're going to have it on Thursday now instead. And so maybe we'll review some of those at that time. And um, the Fourth Avenue well, we we bumped this discussion off of the last um, unresolved issues and um, have listed it today so that community members who were interested could attend. Um, I don't know if someone with more experience in this issue, um, I have blissfully been not directly involved in it. Um, so um, I don't know if someone is on the line that can speak more to it, but basically, it basically it's, um, it has the um, uh, council's original intent, contingent appropriation around this topic been satisfactorily you know, addressed. And I don't know if council member Wharton wants to share your thoughts on that. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. Um... What we uh, what we originally asked last year, um, based on my uh, request, was that um, we put some contingent funding restraints on this particular project, the Fourth Avenue Well, um, to address residents' concerns about. Um, and we they asked us to look at three areas specifically. Um, Number one, the size of the well, and uh, number two, or the footprint of the project, actually, not just the well. Um, number two was uh, issues related to sound, um, the sound that the pump makes, and then um, three, to address the appropriateness um, to the historic neighborhood and the design. Um, then the council also um, it's stated in the language that if it would be helpful um, for the department, they could seek um, input from um, an independent outside um, engineering um, firm. Uh, they, uh, for a number of reasons, um, which were explained to me, which I would consider valid, um, uh, decided not to go with an independent outside review um so uh we hosted a series of community conversations about this um we had a, a facilitator from wilkinson ferrari come and do a number of meetings with um with key sort of neighbors in the community but also um uh opening that up for discussion to from anybody that was interested um, and then having an open house, a virtual open house to share the results of that. Um, so I think that when you look at the, if you look at what was proposed um, in over a year ago, and you look at what is being proposed now, I think that you can definitely see um, the comments and the concerns of the neighborhood come through in this new design. Um, it is quite a bit smaller, um, it is um, quieter, and, well, it's quieter as of right now. The design that's been submitted is only about, uh, is mostly conceptual, and it's, a, it's about a third, um, one third complete. So as they continue to move forward with, um, with the pump house and with the project, they'll try to find ways to make it more quiet. Um, and then, of course, the um, appropriateness to the neighborhood. They uh, looked at a number of different things around the neighborhood um, that the architects did. 
um, and came back to the count or came back to this group with options um, and got their input. And so it, um, I think, um, is a vast, vast improvement. There are still, um, so as I said, there, I attended about probably between the time that the council um, made this request a year ago. Um, I've had um, at least 18 meetings um, on this particular issue, um, one, both meetings like with individuals um, and me in meetings with groups of neighbors, um, and then including all of the meetings that were facilitated by Wilkinson Ferrari. Um, let's see, th there are still um, some um, constituents who are um, not happy about um, some of the issues. I think one constituent um, feels that it doesn't look historic enough. Another um, constituent who is um, who has some technical knowledge about this um, feels that it uh, there not enough has been done to address the uh, the sound issue or the quietness issue. Um, he feels really strongly that the department has not been um, diligent in um, addressing those issues. Uh, although I, I'll note that he um, he did get have a meeting with uh, the deputy director of the department, the engineer that's assigned to the project, um, and uh, had an opportunity to to raise those concerns directly with them. He feels that um, that that meeting was inadequate, um, but they did attempt to have that meeting. So um, let's see. I'm trying to trying to summarize any other. Um, I did send out a neighbor um, an email blast about this, asking um, neighbors to write in um, with their comments about um, about this. It did, and I should say it did go back before the Historic Landmarks Commission, as was required. The Historic Landmarks Commission, which um, previously had expressed a lot of reservation about it, um, did pass it um, or did approve the project. So, are there any questions I can answer about what's been done? Um, I will say it's it's been a pretty thorough process, um, especially given the um, the size of the project. But I do think it was appropriate um, given the very unique location of the project. Um, this park, uh, you know, going into Memory Grove obviously has significance for the entire city because it is, um, you know, Memory Grove and um, so um, it's and it's also very historic, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone else has about the process. And I can have um, Austin forward you the um, just I will have him send you all the emails I've received about this, but the the few that I received since the um, Historic Landmarks Committee meeting, Commission meeting. Um, and Mr. Chair, if I could just share while people are thinking if they have questions. Um, Sam and Lehua have helpfully clarified for me what the key question is for the council, which is there's currently funding for this project in public utilities, but the council has a contingency on it. The funds can't be released until this council decides that the contingency is okay to be released. And then the other question is, do you um, as a council want to adopt a legislative intent to help um, identify guidelines to um, guide future development in historic parks? Because that was one of the issues that was discovered along this process is that there's not really a clear administrative guideline for developing in historic parks. Ooh, Great, I'm a yes and yes. That's charged. That's a charged that well question. The last one. <laughs> I I might have misspoke. I don't mean developing in historic parks like you know an office building or something. But when the city does you know a restroom or a public utilities project, um, which are not guided by the same types of things as some zoning does. So that was a there was a process improvement that was discovered. <laughs> Um, I, I am very interested in the second, um, question and, uh, have told my residents that I would, 
uh, work uh, about or work through this process to try to ensure um, that this we don't get as far down the wrong track as we did on this project uh, in the future. So I'm happy to work with um, council staff and um, and whoever else is interested and uh, maybe put together some initial thoughts, um, lessons learned, and then we could bring that back before the council if that would be a good place to start. I like that idea. Okay. So, Councilmember Mono. So we're for this budget cycle. We're deciding if we release that contingency. But the yes. funds come out of a previous year, so and and out of the public utilities budget. So this was never part of the general fund. And I know that when I first was put on the council, I was given a lot of information about a lot of different things, and this was one of those. But if someone could remind me really quickly what the benefit of building this well is for the city as a whole and, and what how that fits in within the public utilities system uh, maybe that's too long of a conversation but i remember um, being significant but i don't remember why there's I, sam thankfully <laughs> mr chair i see i um i think that i could i could probably attempt to answer that but i i think that jesse stewart and laura briefer might be here not to put them on the spot but i know um they especially will be able to give you the technical detail. Um, <clears throat> at a high level, this well services a significant area of Salt Lake City's downtown during the summertime. So when surface waters are lower, um, as temperatures increase and like uh, runoff <clears throat> in streams from the city's watershed decreases to a certain point and water consumption increases, this well comes online and um, we have some maps, council members, so I can follow up with you on the specifics, but most or all of the city's um, dense urban core relies on, on the supply that comes from this well. And I don't want to um, misquote this, but it's something like, you know, 3 million gallons per day. Someone, again, with the technical background might, might scoff at that. I may have misplaced the figure, but. Sam, for um, my purposes, uh, that's plenty. Thanks. Say again? For my purposes, that's the information I needed. I don't need all the technical. Oh, for the super, all right, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this isn't a new well, it's a new pump house for the well. The well has been in existence for probably 80 years. The current pump, pump station is below ground. It was built in the 1960s. Um, and for safety reasons, um, it's it's critical for the department that it be moved above ground. That's that's why there's no, there's a well there, but there's no pump house. Thanks. That's right. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's the other point is, is the well is old enough that it, uh, it's up to code in terms of the distance that's required between the maintenance workers and a power a kind of power source that services the well. The transformer itself upon which the well relies is also discontinued, like a long time discontinued. And there may be like two of those models of transformer available in the Intermountain West and they're, you know, they're not for sale. So upgrading the well also allows the department to modernize the power source. So there's redundancy. So if the well were to, were to fail, you know, for that reason, it would be uh, repairable as well. Yeah, I did. Um, and yeah, thank you. Just to close, uh, the, I, there are only two comments um, that I received. Um, and as I said, the one um, feels that there wasn't enough um, attention given to the historic um, design, making the building look more historic. And then the other one, um, and I'm just summarizing these, they go into quite a bit more detail. Um, but the second one is, um, you know, expressing um, very strong concern that um, the issue of sound is not um, addressed and that it's still too noisy. Um, so. Any questions from anybody else about this process? 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so, do we need a straw poll to this, or uh, or? I think at the very least, a straw poll to remove the contingency, since that seems like a formal action that was taken by the council. And I, I heard one council member, other council member, say they were supported moving removing the contingency. So. Okay, then um, at this point, I would entertain a straw poll. Chair, I move that we remove the contingencies on this money. Okay, so um, we have a straw poll proposed by Councilmember Rogers that we remove the contingencies on this appropriation um, for the Fourth Avenue well. Um, if you would just uh, indicate your support, I'll go ahead and read it off. So it looks like we have Councilmember Mono is supportive, Councilmember Baldemoros is supportive, Fowler is supportive. Johnston supportive, Dugan supportive, Rogers supportive. Um, and I will indicate uh, my support as well, but ask that the Department um, of Public Utilities continue to address the noise issue and keep the residents updated with um, any new developments or technology um, to address that. So I think that is unanimous. Right. How about the legislative intent? Do we need to do anything on that one or? or is Cool. Now we move the legislative intent to our Thursday meeting. Okay. And and what staff can do between now and Thursday is maybe draft a little bit, uh, draft a, a have a draft of a legislative intent for council to consider on that. Um. The um. The, the next section is um. Any ideas related to contingent appropriations? Um. Last year, there were quite a few ideas that were related to contingent appropriations. This year, it seems like maybe we'll just continue forward some of the funding our future sales tax funding contingencies. Staff is still working through um, editing those contingencies to be relevant based on our current um, financial system uh, limitations. And so uh, we'll get you a draft of that as soon as we have it. It needs to go in the ordinance, the actual budget ordinance. So we'll have to have language um, released soon on that and get that to you. There might also be an interest in um, uh, the transportation funding, treating that similarly to the holding account concept that the council adopted last year, which is by ordinance, you approve the funding so that it's not like you're saying no to any of the projects, but that you just want to understand more about it, more about the process. Um, and then it allows a little more time in, you know, outside of this compressed budget season, it allows more time for the council to meet with the administration to understand all that. And then we've listed some of the legislative intents that we've heard. Um, I, I probably won't go into detail on this because um, we'll have another discussion about it on Thursday. Um, maybe it'll be easier to do then. So with that, I don't know, Mr. Chair, if you want to continue on unresolved issues and go to the spreadsheet, or if you want to switch to a different agenda item, I think we have a little time. Uh, um, yes, um, let's see. I know that um, Council Member Valdemoros asked for a, a personal privilege. I'm just wondering if, uh, I'm sorry, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know that um, I wasn't able to get back to you because we were starting the meeting. Did you want to um, take that moment now or do, would you rather do that during the formal meeting? It's totally up to you. Um, what about twice? I mean, I'm not sure if it's possible to do it twice because I'm not sure how many people are watching right now. I think we might have more public later, but also um, it would be nice to hear from the mayor as well. Okay, um, do you want to hear? Do you want to wait until the mayor makes her remarks and then you can decide if you want to make your remarks now or if you want to wait or if you want to do them during the work session or you want to do it during the formal meeting? Great. Yeah, that will be good. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Um, so let's uh, flip back here. We could go through the spreadsheet that I emailed you guys and just yeah. kind of, I don't know if you feel ready to take straw polls yet or because it, it, it'll, it'll essentially be a rehash of the information. It's just organized in a budget sort of add, adding and subtracting way. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's fine. Unless did, is any, well, yeah, let's do that. 
Okay, and then at any point, um, if council members don't feel comfortable, like this is pretty early in the process still, um, even though we're hopefully gonna adopt next week, it actually does kind of come together really quickly at the end, so. Um, all right, so the first item, um, the first part of the spreadsheet is dealing with revenues. So the first item um, deals with new growth revenue. The mayor's recommended budget does include some new growth revenue that um, Mary Beth estimates based on actual um, certificates of occupancy and construction permits. Um, frequently, in, or I should say in some years, when we finally get the actual numbers from the county, or sorry, from the state tax commission, um, there's a little bit more money than what was in the mayor's recommended budget. Um, and that is ongoing revenue because um, it's built into the base property tax. So we will hopefully get that information where they're required by law to give it to us by June 8th. Um, but Mary Beth had conversations with them today that they hope to get it to you guys or to us this week. So we will get that to you as soon as we know. And um, we can plug that in. If there's anything above what's in the mayor's recommended budget, we can plug that in. And then that can be a source of revenue for the council to use um, if there's other um, expense ideas that you want to fund. All right, um, that's more just informational. The judgment levy is, is more of a decision that the council, does the council want to levy the judgment levy, which would result in 1.5 million in one-time revenue. I don't know, I can't see people again on this. I'm trying to scroll through. Yeah, I don't see any hands on my tool or on my chat feature over here, whatever this is called. Um, <laughs> I don't see the hand. Um, so go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if the council feels comfortable doing a straw poll on the judgment levy or that I think that would help, it would help staff to know because that's a significant, obviously it's a significant amount. Um, it would mean that some of the funding questions, this would be an answer to some of the Mr. Chair, ideas that you guys have. Yeah, I guess, I, Rogers. I guess for me, I'm not ready to eliminate it as a possible funding source, but I'm not ready to say I'm all in on it yet either. Great, okay, that is fine. I'm with James on that. Okay. Um, then uh, you could, let's see, this, this is more of a conceptual idea, so maybe I'll, Number, line item number three um, deals mostly with um, funds not encumbered in fiscal year 19 and 20, um, because we're also talking about that in the context of the um, housing uh, proposal. It's the community land trust money that's sitting essentially, right? Um, so because we're also talking about that in the context of the housing proposal, it may make sense to wait on straw polling this item for the annual budget until you have that budget amendment six discussion later. Um, either way. Okay. On uh, North Temple CDA funds. So um, this is the amount, $996,000 that's above um, what is currently needed to pay the debt service for this fiscal year. So you could um, address the evolving situation on North Temple uh, because we don't have a specific you know, project in mind for that idea, we would probably recommend that you put that in a holding account where the administration comes back to you and says how they would recommend spending that. Um, or you could just hold it in fund balance, which is actually kind of similar idea anyway. <laughs> you could hold it in fund balance either to assess spending it on North Temple or to assess, you know, maybe the general fund needs it to balance at some point in the annual budget. And I see Council Member Rogers. Um, Council Member Rogers, go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if this is the time to talk about it, but I am actually looking at using the North Temple Viaduct funds as well as capturing the funds from CIP projects and using that towards the North Temple issue or a catalytic project along North Temple. You are, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. You, you are uh, the 986,000 we see there and the 422. Yep. All for the North Viaduct? Uh, for North Temple. Or North Temple? Yep. For either looking at one, an issued uh, area from a uh, property there, we're looking at ways to, you know, counter the, the effects that are going on there. But 
I think to help spark the North Temple, looking at RDA as well as looking at, I think it's a good combination of funds. Don't we also have money in the RDA? That's what I want to we want to wrap them all together. So in total, though, that would be because how much do we have? I think we're at, we'd be close to three over three or a little um, closer to three million. Where would that money go? Because for me, if we're going to do something like that, then and wrap it all together with the RDA, then I would, I don't want like, like well, that, where, where would it go? How would yeah, you? Let's, we'd put it in a holding account and wait for the administration <laughs> to come back. And I think that the administration could work hand in glove with the RDA to make sure that they work together on it. I feel comfortable with the 996, but the 422, I, I'm still wrapping my head around. Okay. So you, you, keep, you keep on thinking about it. That's that's what the plan that I would like to go forward with. Because I would like to keep the 422 in CIP. Councilmember Fowler, in response to your question, how much is in the holding account for a North Temple catalytic development? It's just over eight hundred and three thousand dollars currently. Not that much. Is that hey Ben? Can you tell me is that with this year's money as well, or is that is that total funding for that? I thought there was more than that with all the projects that we're looking at. That's how much has already been appropriated. There's additional money proposed for fiscal year twenty one. Right. I think it's an additional. I want to say 250,000, but let me check. Okay. Yeah, it's a little less than that, but it's close, over 200. So we can um, just put a, a star on these items and come back to them. I, I would support James's proposition on the uh, North Temple Viaduct Fund being repurposed and uh, discussing the uh, CIP fund as well. Sorry. You kind of cut out for me on the last one. You support the for, for CAP. Support the North Temple Viaduct CDA account um, being reallocated towards the North Temple issues, uh, specifically the catalytic projects, and then also the uh, CIP project for the three years. Okay. I'll make a note of that. And then we can focus on that at the next unresolved issues discussion, which I think will be this Thursday. And then we put in a placeholder for um, potential CARES Act funding. Um, we still don't have any information. We thought we might have information from the federal government at this point of how much the city might be getting um, in CARES Act funding, but we don't. So um, you could treat it as a, a placeholder mentally of, you know, once we get CARES Act funding, we intend to address, um, I don't know, for example, fire overtime or something like that, or fire PPE. Um, and so that's why we have this sort of separate column for CARES Act funding. But um, it, it may or may not make sense to put it in the actual budget um, adoption process. So we can just watch that with finance as we go. All right, so now to, unless there's any questions on that, Looking through, I don't see, see questions. Okay. Okay. So on expense items, um, you have, and this is just alphabetical. So um, you have the attorney's office. Um, so one of the ideas is um, you could expand their workload by restoring vacancy savings. You could, and that's thirty one thousand eight forty three. So the amounts in the column um, reflect what it would be if you wanted any one of these ideas. And we would just add it. Uh, you could add a litigator FTE or a legal secretary FTE, and these are fully loaded costs. So these are um, salary and benefits. I don't know if um, anyone has a proposal or if this is kind of all something that we should just drop hole on Thursday. Is this where we could do the unfreezing? Yes. Have so, it in their budget as a vacancy saving but they're frozen. Right, so an assistant attorney, assistant city attorney 
is currently vacant and the mayor's recommended budget proposes keeping it vacant for six months, which were, which then they, they took 31,000 out of the attorney's office budget to account for that vacancy savings. If the council gave that back to the attorney's office and authorized the hiring of that FTE, the attorney's office could fill that FTE and um, they, that FTE could help with workload. Yeah, I don't, the assistant, I didn't read that correctly. I care less about the assistant city attorney, but the litigator is, they're asking for a new FTE. There's not a vacancy saving in their office. So yeah, right. This would be a new FTE. Correct. Yeah. Right. This would be a new FTE. Sorry, my internet connection keeps pausing. And so I apologize if I'm talking over people. Um, these are new FTEs, and uh, I don't know that it's correct to say that they are asking for them. Um, they're not in the mayor's recommended budget, but we we provide them as information in case the council wants to add them, right? So it's up to you. No, I'm pretty sure I asked what they needed, and that's the answer <laughs> that we got. So I, I did a mistake that they did not ask for it. <laughs> okay. So, um, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll follow your direction. Do you think maybe I just go through this whole list rather than, because it, you know, we don't want to straw poll one and have it kind of yeah. go in front of others. And then maybe um, if the council feels comfortable, we can plan on Thursday. We'll be kind of a more focused on the spreadsheet conversation. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Great. So then in community and neighborhoods, um, kind of in a similar way, we just provided um, a couple of, um, different levels of planners. If you were to add planners to the planning staff, I think between now and Thursday, maybe our staff will circle back with Nick Norris to confirm if they do in fact, um, if they can in fact handle that zoning rewrite project by just doing a reorg of their existing staff or if they need extra staff. So we'll plan on revisiting that. Um, community and neighborhoods, some of the funding for homeless services is located in community and neighborhoods. Um, and some is located in public services. Public services is obviously more focused on like the parks cleanup. I think CAN does have a little bit of the homeless camp cleanup funding in it. So we'll have to, staff will get more clear on which funding is in which department um, and what might be needed. But we just flagged this in the interest of if you um, feel like the situation's not gonna necessarily change significantly, um, then, um, you might want to allocate some funds there, or you could choose to revisit it in a budget amendment. The, the challenge with revisiting it in the budget amendment is that there are fewer tools available. It's fund balance, basically. <laughs> so, okay. Then um, this concept of adding transportation funds to a holding account. So um, what staff did is uh, put just the funds from that transportation funding related to projects. So there are a few FTE and salary expenses that are paid with the county transportation fund. And so we wouldn't put those in the holding account, but anything related to a new project. Jennifer? Yes. Cindy, may I insert? Um, we were speaking with the chair and vice chair uh, just before this meeting and realizing that we did not we have more business uh, than we have time to get through it between now and the ninth. So that's where the idea of meeting on Thursday came up. And we have not cleared that yet with council members. We had it on our uh, tentative pos list of possibilities, but um, the council might need to talk a little bit about that. I've gotten a couple of texts from people saying Thursday with lots of capital letters and question marks. So sorry about that. We didn't intend to surprise you, but we did. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Every year on our budget schedule, we put Thursdays um, as optional meetings towards the end of the budget. And um, we're finding this year, especially that we seem to be needing that time. But I don't know, it's up to you guys. Um, council members, um, if you want to, if anybody wants to speak to that right now, we can, um, or if we'd rather, uh, if you'd rather message me and Cindy offline, we can discuss that as well. So, 
Okay. Great. Okay. So um, one item I realized I failed to mention when we were going through the revenue items is that the dollar amount that's in that CIP project line item is actually, um, if, if the council wants to have a discussion about the daycare project, you could add $250,000 to that amount. So I don't know if the council wants to discuss whether or not the daycare is a... Is a um, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I forgot to oh. mention that one too, that I would like to capture that money for North Temple funding as well. Okay. You want to capture it from and apply it to the um, catalytic project or you just want to yes. capture it for fund balance? No, for funding in the, uh, so the administration could come back and talk about how they'd use the money along North Temple. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd just I'd like to make maybe make that two lines, the 422 and 250, two separate lines, just so we can. Okay. Great, we'll do that. Okay. So back down on the expense line items. Um. Uh, let's see. Since uh, the spreadsheet that I emailed to Amanda and to you, I added. A line item for fire to restore the vacancy savings in fire based on council member Fowler's interest. And I have to get the exact amount, but I think it was 200, 200 and something thousand dollars. Um, that would be um, if you wanted to restore the vacancy savings there. I don't know if there's any other questions on that item. Okay. Then in the police budget, um, and these are just various ideas that have come up um, from council members. This was actually based on last week's discussion before the events of this last weekend. So again, maybe it would be worth having a deeper discussion once the chief and mayor are on the line. But these are the four items that came out of last week's discussion. I think we could probably, we'll probably do quite a bit of editing after today's um, discussion with the police, but the ideas that were raised last week were additional funding for overtime based on actuals used, additional funding for mobile surveillance units. We got a cost on that, they're about $40,000 each. Additional funding for de-escalation training and an additional funding for a victim advocate position in police. This would be separate than the victim advocate position in the prosecutor's office. Then in public services, um, we noted uh, in the public services staff report that uh, the vacancy savings proposed in the budget will result in um, quite a bit of noticeable uh, service level decrease in terms of the maintenance of city property. And so we've added just a general line item for um, adding funds back into that maintenance um, concept. So it would most likely be in parks and public lands, but we could work with the administration to figure out where the appropriate place is for that based on council member interest um, in that. Any questions on that? And then additional um, funding for homeless camp cleanup. Um, that's related to the line item we discussed earlier. And then um, we're just tracking an item in the non-departmental budget that would be adding funding for the in-between. And depending on um, council discussions, the source of that is to be determined. It could even just be general fund um, if there's sufficient dollars once we get the final revenue. I don't know if there's any other questions on that. Okay. All right, well, that, that's unresolved issues. That feels fast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, council member Fowler it's looks like a question. Uh, was cast. <laughs> uh, we have some time to talk about some things, so that's good. Is this the time where we can talk about, oh wait, and maybe you already did bring it up, but um, would we do, and maybe we did a struggle. I, my brain doesn't work much these days without like I'm focusing because there's about a thousand other things I'm thinking of, but I was thinking of the housing trust fund move money and moving it over to um, the Housing Development Trust Fund. I think we talked about it last week, but you mentioned yes. a motion. Would we just do a motion in our formal meeting and would that be on June 9th? And is there other discussion on that? I don't know. We kind of discussed yes. on it, I think, right? You guys already did do a straw poll on it. Okay. Um, and so I, I apologize. I ended the discussion on that spreadsheet too soon. We listed it in the sort of other funds category. 
Um, what I'm working through with finance is to figure out, do we need to show it on like the budget line items or is it sufficient to just by motion say, these funds will be moved and then you figure out the budget as the year goes on, right? Like as payments come in, you adjust the budget. Um, so I'm just working through finance on that, but the way I see it, it would be a motion as part of your budget amendment adoption, both as the council and as the RDA. Um, and so we'll work on that. I don't know if council members had other questions on that, but our, you guys did take a straw poll on that. Um, I can't remember if it was an RDA or council now. My days are all running together too. So. Um, uh, oh. Okay. I don't know if council members have other questions or if. Um, I, I, I'm not seeing any other questions. We've still got about 15 minutes until the mayor was gonna join us. Um, we had scheduled a tentative break that I didn't think that we would have time for, but it looks like we do now. So I think let's just go ahead and take 15 minutes um, and everybody meet back here at 4.30. Can I ask a question because the new agenda doesn't have time on it? Yeah, it'd be uh, abandoned. Are we just anticipating this is the break and we will then go straight from our, our work session to a formal meeting? No, I don't think so because, uh, but it, it all depends on, I mean, if we use all the time about these last two items that we have um, with the mayor, then, then obviously yes, but um, we had hoped to make it so that we would also have like about 30 minutes in between um, our work session and our formal meeting. Um, and then just so people can think about it, um, another option if people don't want to meet on Thursday is we could uh, we could vote to move our action on um, formal action on the agenda to, um, a week later. We only have to have excuse me not on not formal action on the budget. We only have to have the budget approved by the end of the month. So we can we have, there's plenty of room to push it back a week if people would rather do that. Um, but I would like to remind you that there are a lot of things that we have put on the agenda for as soon as the budget is over. So it just puts all of that back another week or two as well. So um, just something to think about. We don't have to decide now, but something to think about. Okay, thanks. See you all at 4.30. Stay cool, okay. Um, but we can start with the questions that we had to um, our police department. Um, so I had asked uh, in light of the, um, the murder of George Floyd and the events that took place after that, um, asked our police department to come back and talk to us a little bit more about um, a couple of, uh, of issues that are specifically related to that. The first is um, de-escalation training that our officers receive. The second is uh, implicit bias training. Um, and third is um, efforts to recruit more, um, more diverse officers to the force. And um, I we I did ask about those um, earlier in the budget briefing, but um, and the op, the department gave a response, but I did want to re-raise those issues um, and talk about them a little bit more in depth and see if maybe we need to make um, some adjustments uh, based on um, events that have transpired over the last couple of days. So I appreciate and the police department coming back to talk to us. Um, I will say that we had planned on having um, our police chief here, but he's not able to join us um, due to a, a personal emergency. Uh, so, but we do have Deputy, D, uh, Deputy Chief Doubt uh, available. And um, so I will turn the time over to him. Um, if you, Deputy Chief Doubt, if you want to just go through. Um, each of the those questions that I um,
just mentioned. Um, and um, let's see. Yeah, if you want to just touch on those and then we can open it up to questions from council members. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, let me first apologize by saying, of course, we're extremely tired. <laughs> And uh, I was notified of this briefing just a, a little while ago. So I may not have specific answers. If I don't, please ask follow-ups and, and I can try to answer those questions for you. But as for de-escalation training, uh, everything in our academy are re are revolving around the use of force uh, has de-escalation components built into that. Um, uh, for example, every scenario that we, that we uh, have our recruits and our officers go through, uh, even through in-service training, uh, everything it talks about de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. And when they uh, do that in the scenarios that they actually uh, perform to see that they learned the lessons that we've taught them, uh, we we uh, we evaluate that whether they de-escalated or not. Specific, specific de-escalation tactics as we talk about de-escalation, sometimes the public just, uh, has a different understanding of de-escalation than the police do. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, those don't mean the same things to, to different people. And so as we talk about de-escalation, de-escalation is the tactic of slowing things down and giving ourselves time and distance to make better decisions. And so that's, that's everything that we do in our training academy is to slow things down as the best that we can, uh, if we can do that, and to give ourselves time or distance. Uh, using either tactics, which is what we teach for use of force tactics and uh, and the way we respond and those tactics. Um, those are all taught in the academy over and over again. It's, it's built into our basic lesson plan. Uh, another part of de-escalation is the ability to use verbal uh, uh, dialogue with people. And uh, and so we all uh, uh, teach in our academies and we also the, the funding that you gave us for Arbinger and for Blue Courage and uh, and for those kind of courses like that, where we teach people how to talk to each other. Uh, our CIT courses uh, that we teach people how to talk to each other and de-escalate and give ourselves that time and that distance to be able to help us and the people we're dealing with make better decisions. And then of course, the last class that you, that you guys have given us funding for is implicit bias. And that just uh, helps our officers understand that we all have biases, whether we understand them or not, and helping us identify those biases and make better choices and understand those choices as we move forward. And now again, that's the escalation because it helps us understand that we may be making wrong choices uh, based on our biases. Um, biases. Um, we do fair and impartial policing uh, classes as well uh, that help us understand and be able to just understand and be able to deal with those biases and uh, those 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 things that that our officers deal with every day that may uh, cause them to make bad decisions. And so we we, uh, we appreciate the funding for that. We just recently uh, sent out an update to a fair and implicit bias uh, from that organization that uh, we had to come in and train us, our train our trainers. That talks about uh, minority communities and the wearing of masks during this COVID-19 time. And so that's been a mandatory class that we've had our officers take. It's an online class um, that they can watch a video and answer some questions. And so. Um, I hope that answers your questions about those de-escalation training. Um, Council Member Connor. Hi, Chief. And Hi. I just want to say, you know, thank you for uh, the work you're doing and, and for that answer and for really trying to implement that within our police force. I did have a question, and I think. Clearly, it's it, I, this question comes from um, the the incident with Floyd George and um, and and the the Minneapolis police. Do any of these classes address holding each other accountable and and staying? You know, I think that, and I recognize this um, that. You know, you work with people so in depth and in such an intense situations, you become like family. And sometimes it's difficult to to talk with family about, hey, maybe you shouldn't have or should or shouldn't do this or whatever. And I'm wondering if any of those programs address sort of that and empower 
um, other officers to hold their their co-officers accountable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they they kind of all touch on it, but the one that really but the one that really goes into it the most is Blue Courage. Uh, Blue Courage teaches uh, about the uh, the nobility of the profession of policing. Why we all got into this to begin with. And it talks about and teaches us to, to realize, you know, why we got in this and to hold ourselves accountable to that higher standard, both ourselves and our and our, uh, our our peers. And also, we teach that in our academy as well. And we also have a code called 909. Uh, it's it's kind of an internal culture code that when someone starts to get out of control, uh, officers are encouraged to uh, to say 909, and that tells them that the, the, the hey, I recognize you're out of control, and they should step in. I think I, I watched a video the other, uh, I, I don't even remember what day it is now. I'm sorry, it's all one big day, but um, I watched a video um, a little while ago uh, of protest and it was not in Salt Lake, but it made me think we're actually, we're, we're, we're gaining ground, we're making, we're making progress where I saw a, a person taken into custody and an officer knelt on his neck for just a second or two. And the other officer reached over and grabbed his, his knee and moved it off his neck. And I, I know that that would happen in Salt Lake and, and uh, because our officers are trained to intervene and, we, and we, do, we do try to hold ourselves accountable. Most of our internal affairs complaints come from our employees, not from the public. Okay. And so um, they, they do, uh, they, we do try to hold ourselves accountable. And I, I think, thank you, I appreciate that. And I think that's something that we need to continue looking at. I also, um, I have not slept. And so I just wanna say, I know his name <laughs> is George Floyd, but we are, a, all not sleeping and I was thinking about how to word what happened and, and how to word that things sometimes uh, because anyway so I appreciate that you are looking at that and I think we need to continue that and and empower our police officers to hold each other accountable as much as we we can and us to hold our police officers accountable and, those and, and, I, and I will say we need to double down we, we we hold responsibility in this thing that's going across, gone and gone across the country. You know what I mean? The history of law enforcement and the racism that's been here since, you know, the 19, early 1900s or before that. Um, it's just the history and we got to, we have to own that history and we have to double down and realize that what we're doing, what we're doing is not, is not working in some of our communities. And so we're doing that and we will continue to do that. Councilmember Fowler or Valdemoros. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that and for um, um, telling us about the programs that you have. I uh, I appreciate the police department. I've gotten you know comments um, commending the, the police department because um, Chief Brown and previous or former Chief Burbank um, worked um, to change certain things uh, for the better, uh, and so. Um, you know, some somebody says that you know we've done great strides because those people were part of the commission, etc. And so um, I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear that, and I'm glad um, to hear that we can continue to improve. That there are things that we you know we ought to improve. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you is um, we have that in internal affairs, right? Like um, so after that, what happens? Like if um, one of our police officers gets out of line and, and doesn't, you know, comply with what the policies are or protocols. What are like usual um, measures, you know, to to, you know, I, I don't want to say punishment, but what are the what are the consequences like of of something that wasn't supposed to happen? The city has tier threes of, or three tiers of discipline. And the first one is, uh, well, there's actually four if you consider coaching and counseling. So of course, if it's a minor violation, it's coaching and counseling. Next highest level is a tier one discipline, which is a letter of warning. The second discipline is um, up to uh, two shifts, of, two shifts of, of suspension. And then the third tier of discipline is more than two shifts of, dis, dis, of suspension without pay or demotion or termination. And so those are the options that we use to discipline our officers. And, and, and does that affect the ability for an officer to find another job in another police department or um, in, in, in your profession or, or it's, not, it's not really that 
Uh, let, let me just say, if, if, if there are certain offenses that we have to report to peace officer standards and training, that could affect their licensure to their certi certificate to uh, enforce the law in Utah. Um, um, those are certain offenses that we report to them by, by law. Um, um, but um, we can't control where they get hired anyone at, where, anywhere else and another agency may hire them. I can say we, I, I can't think of anyone we, we hire from the, that's gotten fired anywhere else because that's one of our disqualifying factors for us. Oh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Dugan. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, 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 the briefing on the train. I, 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 and I appreciate all the work you guys have been doing. Uh, it isn't an easy job and, and uh, you're, uh, you're commended for the, the patience and the, the thoughtfulness that you've put into the, the work here. My question on the, on the uh, when an incident occurs, is there group discussions like in a closed room with the other police officers to discuss the matter, see how they would handle it so that they all understand what went wrong and and the, understand the biases and how things evolved. And so that there's a learning from every incident that goes across the police department and across everyone there that they all see it and then they can now make sure that they don't repeat it. And maybe they actually can then train other guys and say, yeah, I had a similar incident to this. You know, it's like a lessons learned of experience. I had a similar incident. So this is how I de-escalated it. Is that does that train go on when there's an incident or is that just uh, a natural inborn to the, to the police department? Oh, no, that goes on all the time. And there's different levels of that. In fact, we, we did what we call a hot wash hours after the the first protest the other night the violent uh, violent criminal activity we saw we did a hot wash that night where officers come together what what, what worked well what didn't it's very informal and we, then we immediately implement those things those things that we can immediately which is why you saw so a few things different last night than you saw on Saturday because we learned from our mistakes at some point when this all dies down, we will do a very, very in-depth review, and then we will change our training and tactics based on what we learned from that. We've made, we've made some mistakes, and we're going to have to fix those mistakes, um, um, but we'll do that. But we, we don't wait till the thing's over. Um, we, we did a hot wash the first night. We did a hot wash last night before we go home so that we'll learn from what we learned from last night, and we'll change things a little bit tonight to make it a little bit better. So that's just that's what we do, the informal hot wash, and then the, 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 when the incident's completely resolved, then we'll go back and do a very in-depth review. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Romano. Thank you, Chief Dow, and I appreciate you explaining some of the measures that you are taking and that you have taken. Uh, my question is how we can, uh, two things, get this um, information, express what we're doing to the community, but also how the police department can listen to the community um, for what are some really valid concerns um, that, that we're hearing about that I think deserve specific responses. And I wonder what the, maybe it is just this meeting right now, or if there's anything you can imagine in terms of a furthering a community conversation um, and, and actually having a space for that. Is there, yeah, I know. is there anything planned or anything that you that you think could happen? I know Chief Brown and, and myself both are, are very, very uh, open to meeting with community members. We we op we meet with the community advocates group, uh, you know, twice a week. Unfortunately, COVID has suspended that, but we're going to start resuming it with uh, virtual meetings for a while and see what happens with that. Um, uh, we meet with we've met with them for three years, um, and it, and it ebbs and flows with how many people are coming. Sometimes it's and sometimes it's 50. Um, we meet with the uh, the chief meets with his community advisory board, and 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 we meet and the chief meets with with community groups all of the time. Uh, and so we we but we will always be open to uh, doing anything we can to open that back up and have some more forums that we could meet with the community and have them express, you know, their anger and their frustration with us, and maybe we can learn what they want us to do better. And if we have constituents that want that, what's the best way to link them with um, the individuals that they would have that conversation with? Uh, they could uh, they can contact us through our website, um, um, through our public relations or our public outreach, uh, which is on our website. 
or just send us an email to anybody in the department and we can hook them up with what we need to do, but it's all on our website. Thank you. Um, Deputy Chief Doubt, um, uh oh, oh good, you're back. Um, is there a point where there's too much de-escalation training or too much implicit bias training? I don't think there's ever too much training. The only problem I have with, with, with training is the ability to get people in there and keep people on the street to respond to calls for service. That's my only issue with training. If we could train, you know, 50% of the time and, and put people on the street, 50%, that's, that would be great. Yeah. Um, but that's our only limitation is, 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 is keeping people on the street and uh, or keeping enough people on the street to respond to calls for service. So, I mean, what about ongoing training? What if I'm an officer that's already taken blue courage and I've already, you know, I'm a, I'm maybe not like the, the most senior officer, but I'm, you know, in the middle there. What, what, am, what does the department do for officers in that position to make sure that they're continuing to receive implicit bias and other training? Well, we have elective classes that they can take, and we just opened up the FBI Virtual Academy for them as well, and so they can take classes from the FBI Academy um, virtually. Um, we, we, the city offers uh, uh, reimbursement for tuition, things like that, and we're always looking for more classes. You know, we're just finishing up with this round of implicit bias and and uh, Arbinger. We're we got to look out there and see what's next. We're we're gonna we're gonna find out what's next. What's the next best thing to teach our people? which I'm sure is gonna come out of this whole thing nationwide of some kind of best practices. And we're gonna find out what those are and we're gonna to have to get our people trained on those. Okay. Um, so is there anything that that we know that we could be doing now to, to do more? I mean, are there, are there well, are there classes out there that maybe other departments and other states are doing that, that we should be doing? Our training staff's been directed to look for those right now um, because we're just getting ready to wind up these training cycles of these, because this has been a three-year training cycle for Arbinger and Blue Courage and, uh -huh. Courage and Fair and Implicit. So we just wanted to get as many people through as we could, and then we'll start with something new. And so they've been directed to look for those things. And who uh, are these trainings done through post or are these done internally by our department? Well, they're usually done. I wouldn't say internally. I would say usually we find somebody to teach our to teach our instructors and certify our instructors to be instructors, and then we bring them in. It's it's more cost effective that way than trying to bring instructors from outside the side of the state and, or outside the city in for you know seven hundred employees. And so we we teach our our own people how to be instructors, and then they can instruct. Okay, and so that that's kind of is the we. SLC PD or is the we like post or who is the we here? It, it's it's SLC PD and then it's it's considered post hours because we're our instructors are post certified instructors. Okay, if an officer, what if they make like a lateral transfer from another department in Utah where they aren't where they they weren't required to take um, um, Blue Courage or the other one that you mentioned? Do they have to take these classes to? when they onboard to Salt Lake City? They they take Blue Courage in the academy and then we, we require them to take the other ones and then I believe it's in the first year. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I know that, that we, like our department already has received a lot of awards for de-escalation, a lot of recognition for that. Um, but obviously, you know, we still have um, incidents in, in Salt Lake City that uh, that cause a lot of public concern. Um, so what, um, aside from like specific classes, which you said people are already looking for, what else can we do um, to lead, not just Utah, but to lead other cities across the nation in, um, in these efforts? I mean, what else can we do besides taking classes? we need to get our officers into the communities. And I think that's happening because of the funding and the staffing that you've given us to allow us to do that. 
now they have they're going to have they have the time now to do that where we were we were starting to do that when COVID hit and that kind of just kind of just put a halt on everything for us for a while but as that maybe dies down, dies down a little bit this summer we can start getting back in into the communities with our officers not our command staff i mean we're there already but our officers who are there in the communities with the people that you you represent right and then they get to know them and they understand them one-on-one and we're part of the community and they're part of us okay um what about bringing um can you talk a little bit more about recruitment efforts for minority officers i mean i know that that is a struggle um and i know that that you know utah um you know the demographics of Utah probably make that hard too. About the 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 applicant pool that you get is probably I'm sure predominantly white, male. Um, is there anything else that can be done to um, to make our department more? Uh, well, I don't want you to get into like uh, compensation negotiations and stuff like that, but to to be a competitive hire for. Um, for diverse officers. Well, that's something that departments across the country struggle with. And I think it has to do a little bit with our demographics, maybe a little bit more than what I'm thinking, but, or what I'm saying, but, but it also has to do with um, our relationships with our community too. I mean, we still have people who don't really wanna be cops, right? Be cops, right? They don't like cops. They don't wanna be around cops. And so, is what it's kind of a chicken and egg thing and we're trying to figure that out which comes first people in the department who are minority um, members of the community that represent our community or or getting into the community so they want to be here it's kind of a synergistic thing and, and um, we we really want to get out there and meet with our community members and show them that we're not we're not these evil people that some some of them think we are and and they can and they they ought to aspire to be cops and serve their communities and so um, that's what we're really trying to focus on is to get into our communities and to recruit those people, those leaders that are within those communities that and and teach them and show them that we're not that we're not evil. We're not we're not out there trying to to be racist and 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 use force and things like that. A lot of people just generalize st stereotypical ideas of police officers. And so I think as we as we try and work with our communities more and, and it's a concerted effort to do that i think we can recruit more people now like you said the demographics of utah are a little bit different but it ought to match the demographics of utah yeah and it doesn't and it doesn't and so we we need to make sure that that does and we're striving to do that um what about like programs like what you talked about getting out in the community like um south salt lake has done their promise program um is that something that you think would be valuable here to to have um like young people um interfacing with police and you know playing basketball or doing other things like that i think that would be great um what would it cost for salt lake city to do something like that i'm sorry i i don't have any clue on that we could get that for you but i'm not yeah. familiar with that program enough to understand the cost Okay. Um, if what if the council wanted to to and I I have we haven't had this discussion I haven't even had this discussion one on one with council members but what if the council wanted to um, divert more funding to the department solely for um, de escalation and implicit bias training and recruitment of diverse officers what what would you do with that. Um, would that change the, any of the answers that you've given? Like if you had the funding available? If I had the funding available to bring officers in on overtime to train them, we could find effective training to 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 teach those tactics, those de-escalation tactics we talked about. And what do you think um, what would be a range of something that would that would have a meaningful impact on the department? You know, I don't want to give you like I don't know, fifty thousand dollars, and have like you know one one training, and then it's like okay, well we got that done. Um, like, what would have? Do you think a me a measurable or you know it's hard to say measure a uh, noticeable or meaningful impact on the department? Uh, I would say uh, probably ten hours per officer. Okay, what is that? 
Where is Kelly, that? what is that? I got, is that like a million dollars or? I'll have, to, I'll have to ask Shelly what that is. Okay. I would have to wrap up those numbers that you're talking about rotating up 500 people through um, training at 10 hours a piece. And the average rate's probably, if, if we're back filling with overtime, it's like $52 an hour. So I'd have to run those numbers yeah. to make them exact for you or a better estimate. But that's all what I could give you for right now. And Mr. Chair, we could work with finance in the mayor's office on that also. Okay. I, I mean, I'd be interested to hear like what those numbers would be or a range of what those numbers would be. Mr. Chair, this is Lisa. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. It's This is the first time I've seen people's faces tonight. Nice to see everybody. Hey, um, if you have, do you have those questions written down? It seems like you're referring to a specific list of questions. Um, I'm actually not. I'm just uh, writing all over the questions, like a couple of the questions that I did write down. Okay. But I can write them down. What I, what I would love is if we could um, get together and kind of go over those and we could work through um, the logistics of that and the numbers associated, the budget numbers associated with that. If this is the some is this something that the council wants to address um, in a budget amendment or in fiscal year 21. Well, if we had the information, then I think it would be great to have that discussion. Um, but if it's not possible to get that before. You know, Thursday or Tuesday when we're set to adopt um, yeah. something we don't push it back further. I mean, I think yeah, I mean, it's a tricky time and nobody wants to underestimate how important this conversation is mm -hmm. and I think that we are all committed to making sure that um, the concerns that are being raised here and the requests being made are addressed in a factual and considerate way. So. I, I would love to collaborate with you on that and make sure that we get you good information. Okay, Council Member Valdemoros. I, I think I think we, we I'm of the opinion that we need to work on this sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, and let, let's say we were not able to get all the information together before next week because time constraints because we have a lot of things going on. Um, is it possible that we did set aside a portion of our budget for that purpose, like we do on a lockbox and then revisit after budget and release the funds if the administration wants I, to? I think, you know, this is an interesting time, right? Because we're right up against uh, the end of the budget and Jen Bruno can jump in here at any moment. But the um, budget amendment that you're about to receive, if you haven't already, will address some police overtime costs associated with protests and the, the current situation, that um, budget amendment will probably give you some indication of what the costs are associated with overtime for police officers. And uh, we can certainly, you know, it's, it's within your purview to allocate funding towards um, overtime for police training or any other uh, police activity and uh, certainly with the overtime. So what we've given you is an estimate of what we think the overtime is going to be. Um, and we have specific codes allocated for that overtime. Um, if you as a council deem that training is part of the overtime uh, allocation, then we can certainly accommodate that. Okay. And I think that I, as, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Chair. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I think that the information we got for the budget amendment, which is actually it's it's supplemental information that the council would have to add into budget amendment number six, which I guess we're going to yes. talk about soon. Um, that's related to almost like the past, right? Or or what is anticipated for before the end of this current fiscal year that you're in. If you're talking about training and needing to sort of put together additional information about training, we could absolutely put a placeholder budget in the annual budget. That you're also adopting next week so you're doing it at the same time but um in my mind it, it because it's money that would have to wouldn't be likely be spent before the end of the fiscal year anyway um in terms of money for training you know money for overtime to account for training 
you could put that in the annual budget as a placeholder. Um, back of the envelope math is like in the $300,000 range based on what um, Chief Dowd and Shelly were saying that um, you could put in a placeholder and ask the administration to come back with, you know, a more specific proposal. And then at the very least, you've carved out some of that space in the budget and it's a little easier to um, adjust, you know, small amounts here and there in the middle of the year. And, and I would also add to that, you know, I just, I really appreciate that, Jen, in that context and sort of the, the difficulties with the timing issue. And the last thing I want to do is have a, a bureaucratic process get in the way of what it is that you want to accomplish. And so we're going to work hand in glove with you to make um, sure that we accommodate this. Um, and before I end, I just want to say thanks, uh, Chief Doubt. Thanks for everything you're doing right now. I know you're exhausted. Um, thanks for the answers that you've provided here. I think you've been incredibly forthright and honest and, uh, you know, in a spirit of collaboration with everybody. I really appreciate that. So thanks, Tim. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, and uh, sorry, I just have one more question. I know other council members do too. Um, but I, I do want to ask, um, well, first I want to make clear, uh, um, I think I, I'm very proud of uh, how our police officers um, have conducted themselves. Um, I know there have been a couple of incidents which we're already looking into, but like by and large, I think um, that the, our response to uh, the events of the last couple of days uh, have, been, have been very, very, very good. I've seen so many instances um, where I felt like the, it could have gone the other way and I was afraid that it was going to take um, uh, a turn for the worst, and um, and I I think our officers were able to um, avoid that situation, which takes an incredible amount of courage. So I don't want you to think that I'm uh, asking these questions because um, to be critical or um, I mean not I'm trying to be look at our programs with a critical eye, but not be critical of the people. Uh, I hope I'm not coming off that way. Um, but I did have a question. Um, that we talked about earlier in the budget about um, concerns about funding for body cams and um, if we were going to be doing um, if, if that if a way to save money would be to you have cops use other you know mobile devices or their computer or whatever to record things um, and since we had that discussion we had um, the a police shooting in uh, in Kentucky of David Mc, McCaddy. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his name, but um, and there the officers, I think, in that instance, had turned off their body cams or there weren't body cams. It, there was a, there was an issue with body cams in that, and that made me rethink um, about our discussion here. Do you think that um, you know, in light of the events that have happened, that it's still wise to make that that budget savings move, um, or is uh, is it something that um, is not advisable during this time? Like, I'll be honest with you. I wish every cop has a camera. That's that's what we want. Um, as, as we were looking at this and we were presented budget, though, that was not in the budget. That was that was not affordable to do to yeah. under the contract we were negotiating. So that's I guess that's is my short answer. Okay. So. Um, can can we get that um, like information about that too? About how much we're like what exactly we're saving and how if we wanted to restore that funding, what would that um, what would that do? I, I think I read. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, but I did read an email responding back to council staff on that. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Romano. I know you had questions. Yeah, so in regard to the budget, I think these things that we're talking about are really important and, and essential during this time right now where the national conversation is headed. Um, so my, I guess I don't know if it's a question for Chief Dowd or for staff, but why um, I know that we have a, a limited budget and so we had to find savings everywhere we could. Uh, why was it the body cameras that were um, chosen to be eliminated? Are there not other things that that could be eliminated? Um, and similarly, why uh, 
you know, I think the the way the way my mind go, is going is that the body cameras and the implicit bias and de-escalation training are essential and need to happen. And if there are things being cut, I I am concerned that those are the first things that are being cut. So I don't know if we can. I uh, let me just let, let me try maybe explain and, and Lisa, please jump in if I say any of this wrong. <laughs> Uh, I, I believe that the body camera money came from uh, the uh, sales tax, and and we we based that estimate on a, a quote we got from not a quote but an estimate from a vendor, and that turned out turned out not to be the correct cost. And so as we were moving forward trying to get uh, all of the features that were promised to us and the numbers of cameras that were promised, it turned out their their current quote uh, is not uh, is not is not it's above our budget and so that's as we were talking about how can we bring uh the body camera program in on bund under budget or on budget we had to cut cameras and we had to pool cameras which is what a lot of departments around the country do they do pool cameras um in, the, in certain positions like detectives who are who are not out on the street all the time but if they go out on the street they grab a camera and so as as i i, I, I we gave you the, uh, your staff the the recommendations, I think three levels of recommendations and what those levels mean. That's kind of how we got to the point where we're at. We, we kind of got a bad, we kind of got a bad estimate from a vendor. Thanks. And then in regard to the budget process for this, just given the massive numbers of emails that we're all getting, I, I wonder, is this something that the we can take a little bit of extra time on the entire police budget and, and figure out what, or does, like, can that be put in the holding account or no option? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I love the holding account idea and I love the creativity. I really do. Um, I think that we could look at um, ways to carve out if there's a specific aspect of the police department budget that like the cameras. So what we could do is say, leave the budget as is or as proposed with the intention of coming back to amend the budget. The challenge there is that then your only tool to fund any additional needs you identify is fund balance. And so to the extent that you wanna use the tools that are available in the annual budget process, like the judgment levy or like new growth or I don't know what else, um, you would need to have that just in that balancing conversation. And so we could we could look at the, um, the response came in from the police department just this afternoon, so we haven't had a chance to look at it and process it because um, it was while the meeting was going on. But we could look at that answer and figure out what that what those amounts are. We could put a placeholder in based on those amounts. And then you could compare them to all the other needs you are thinking about in the annual budget. I mean, I guess the question goes out to we're discussing adding things to the budget, but is there no way to move things around within the budget to get some of these things? And that's, I didn't know a question that we can you, answer in the next you can you can absolutely move things around, but you have to have consensus about what those things are, and then the administration has to agree that the thing that you've decided to move is not needed. So, uh, actually, the daycare is a perfect example. You could eliminate funding for the daycare, move that funding to the police department to fund cameras, but all seven of you would have to agree that that's a good idea. Uh, you might disagree, and so um, it's that uh, balancing. And I see, sorry, I see. Councilmember Fowler with her hand up and Lisa. Well, and Lisa, did you want to speak to this answer before we go on to a new question? Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Council Chair Borton. I, you know, there are a lot of complicating factors here. And if you haven't been through a budget process before, um, this one is not normal. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how, how else to say it. I really appreciate Jen Bruno kind of guiding us through this because this budget process is incredibly complicated because right now the mayor's recommended budget uh, was recommended as flat. So there wasn't um, recommended funding for body cameras, for example, that were then subsequently taken away. It was just that we are proposing a flat budget that uh, reflected what we did last year in order to be conservative. So there's that complicating factor. Then in the middle of that, we've got this uh, civil unrest issue happening that is exacerbating the issue that exactly the issue that you're talking about. And um, we are right up against uh, you know the passage of a fiscal year budget 
um, in addition to these, you know, these things that are happening in, in our community that we need to be able to nimbly respond to and our processes make it kind of difficult to do that. So I want to be super respectful of the question and I want to make sure that you understand that I'm hearing you and I want to respond to those things. And I think that, that Jen Bruno, Cindy Gus Jensen, Lehua Weaver are incredible assets to you to help navigate the tools that you have at your disposal to help navigate through this budget process. There's always a little bit of a difference between the mayor's recommended budget and um, when the council is able to approve the final council adopted budget. And so you do have some funding resources available to you that you can allocate in ways that were not available to the mayor at the time that she recommended the budget. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that this is a complicated issue. It's a complicated time. Uh, there are serious issues that need to be addressed and we're your partners in that. Um, and we wanna assist in any way we can. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Fowler. Okay, um, I, Councilmember Johnston. Um, I got a, a couple things about this budget piece and then a couple of things with Chief Gatt, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, the first piece on the, bud, on the budget and um, if Jen Bruno's listening or not, um, we do have a, a number of those lines uh, that uh, can be reallocated, we talked about earlier. Um, to anything else. Technically, those could be put into a holding account with an intent to revisit, say, police public safety issues undefined and look at allocating those into next fiscal year. It essentially, be the same as putting it into general and to our general fund and then saying we're going to take this out of the general fund at some point in the next, say, six months or at six months we revisit it. So we could. Take some of that revenue we've undecided at this point, do put a holding and have the conversation going forward as we get more information um, and those things happen. Is that accurate, Jen? Uh, yeah, yeah. And we it, the the details are what we would have to figure out, right? Sure. Like where the funding source comes from. So yeah, I, and we still have the ability. We just have to know that if we kept it unallocated, why we did it, and then be accountable to make sure we, we did it what we want to do later on next month or two or whatever it is. But I think that's, we don't have to rush through figuring out all those things. If we're, if we have a general sense, we want to address some issues, but we don't know exactly how yet, we need more information or time, we could do that. Right, and, and the key, and this is just like the problem of being a spreadsheet person is that you have to figure out where that money comes from to put into yes. that holding account. So, so if we did new growth, um, we looked at the tax lever, whatever yeah. it was, We'd have to be very clear in accounting for those things into an account like this and then have yep. a discussion after we pass this budget uh, about details of how to allocate and use that, correct? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think there's ways we can we can address these things, maybe not be rushed right now. Um, Chief, uh, thanks for taking your time with us today. Uh, I, I echo Lisa Schaefer's comment earlier. Um, and um, I know my thoughts immediately have gone this past week and a half or two weeks about uh, what have I done or not done? What can I do differently? Um, I'm guessing a lot of the council members, um, yourself, Chief, and others are thinking the same thing. Um, I, I respect the uh, willingness that you and Chief Brown um, have to accept feedback and to take a look um, personally at the department. Um, it's not an easy thing the criticism you're taking and still do your jobs. Um, so I deeply appreciate that strength. I really do. Um, the questions we're getting now are, are focused on a number of things, but there's a training question about best practices having more training, which I think we've talked about, and that probably takes funding and time from you and your officers, right? Uh, there's a question about um, structurally, other things we need to change. Um, which I don't know the answer to at this point. It probably takes some time. Um, but I think that goes to the question about accountability for uh, for all of us. Um, do you have thoughts or have um, other processes or things that you've thought about that could help with the accountability question that people are bringing up um, within the confines of state law, obviously? Well, I, I'm not sure. I, I I think I understand what you're asking, but I, I'm not sure that adding just another level would would create what we want to create. 
Um, there are there are um, there are measures in place to hold us accountable, um, mm -hmm. but people need to be involved um, to, to do that. And I, I, I can't I can't tell you how many times I've counted on my hand when when we've had when we've had when we haven't had our civilian review board staffed fully because we didn't have enough people who wanted to take part. Um, I know that the chief and I are, are and I know the chief did this this afternoon uh, with a group of, of people that to to show them our policies and to ask them uh, around force and to ask them how can we change. And I know as part of the IACP report, it recommended that we we develop a a panel from the community to review our policies and to make recommendations to change them and approve the ones that we want to change. And so I know we were planning on doing that before this ever happened. We were moving that way. So, um, but as it relates to creating another oversight body, I just I just don't see what that would serve. I appreciate that, Chief, and I like the idea of looking at more community input. Um, I do have some ideas I forward on to the administration about the um, civilian review board um, uh, that I hope we can address within the limitations we do have uh, based on the state law. Um, thank you. I think this is something that I'll be deep, uh, deeply interested in going forward about structurally, how are we going to continue to improve? Um, because this is a long-term deal that um, when I look at all the issues that affect my, my neighborhood, my community, um, police, a uh, positive police interaction is one of the major ones, obviously, and then looking at that and, um, but there's also deeper issues that I think are, uh, are related to things we're talking about the city housing. Um, low-income neighborhoods, um, healthcare, include all these kind of issues that all roll together. Um, so I, I appreciate, Chief, your willingness to look at these things and work with everyone. Um, I really do. I deeply appreciate you and your department. Thank you so much. Thank you, and and I'm, I, we look forward to working with all of you. I there are some things that I think we could change. Uh, am I willing to talk about them right now? Probably not, but we'll be with you and. And uh, and and work with you and hold your and you hold, hold hands together doing it. Thanks, Chief. Good. Good. Any other questions for uh, Deputy Chief Dow? Councilmember Dugan. Councilmember Johnson, which talked about the the uh, review board, but also about the community advocacy group. And uh, and I know COVID-19 threw a wrench into the machine there and kind of stopped a lot of things, but how is that progressing and, and how do we get more feedback or voice to that group or spread, spread the knowledge around uh, through these times and make sure that there is some, uh, the right voice from everybody and not just through a website. And or is it really working really well? And, and I, I just don't see it. Uh, it. It works. It works when it works, and it doesn't when it doesn't. I'll just, I'll just say it that way. Um, be, because um, they, if you talk to the members of that group who've been involved consistently over the last three years, they can tell you the progress they've made. Oh. They can tell you about the 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 de-escalation awards that they suggested that we implement. They can tell you about. The, the policies that that we've changed at their at their encouragement yeah, they can tell you about uh, the uh, the ten day body cam release policy officer officer involved shootings that they champion so they have influenced our department probably more than anyone else um, but it, it, it's just trying to get people involved like I said sometimes we've come and there's only been four or five people there so but other times there's fifty so uh, it's just trying to get them involved and keep a consistent voice. But I think getting involved is a great thing, but you know, you just said a, a bunch of good things that they have, they did, but does the community hear that? Does it, how does it, how does we get that information out to the community? Because if you don't hear that stuff has been going on, good stuff has been happening through the community involvement with the police, are they doing a good enough job to get it out to the community? Like we put it in different languages and we put it in different places. Is that? Well, I don't think it's their responsibility to do that. I think it's ours, and we probably okay. have failed. Probably have failed at that. So we need to do a better job. 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, council members, other questions on this item? All right. Thank you. Oh, Council Member Valdemoros. So, on that same light, have we ever had that group or either group come to a council meeting and just give us an update of, of you know, the things that they worked on with our police department, things that they accomplished, they think that the things that they would like to accomplish, like, uh, has that happened before or is it something that we could have happen? Um, uh, does somebody else want to ask? I, no, I've never, I don't think the CAG has ever come before us, the uh, community action group has briefed the council um, before. Um, and I don't, um, I mean, I don't know that like, that's the best way to get the word out to the community about what CAG's doing e either. Um, so, but I don't know if anybody else wants to. I would just kind of echo that. I think that'd be one way for us to have an idea of what, what the group is doing. And mm -hmm. so, we can help spread the word through our communities. Okay. I mean, be a great thing. Is there, a, again, is there a chairman or chairperson of this group, or is it just kind of, does the police department kind of, I don't know, how is it, how is it organized? We, we do not run CAG. We okay. are just participants with them and we, we have dialogue with them. Um, they, 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 they do have some informal leaders, but no one's really been declared a leader of the group. Okay, so it's really it's an informal group more than a structured group like a, any other nonprofit group. There's not like a chair or a vice chair and they vote on to, to joins. They have um, some some I, I wouldn't call them officers, but they have positions that traditionally they were rotating those once a quarter and holding elections once a quarter. So they do have some designated people. Those positions changes quite often, but um, there are some informal leaders of the group, though, that we do contact uh, when we have issues and they contact us. So this, Mr. Chair, this is where I, I'm kind of going with uh, Council Member Valamoros is that it'd be nice for us to have that information so we can maybe give it a little bit more structure mm -hmm. and a little more um, not authority, but uh, influence with a, in their community or with us. It says, hey, this is what we're doing. And we 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 want your support and we want your membership from the different communities, but if it's if it's a silent one there that's just on the web, then it's really not doing any of the community that maybe not is not looking at the website. They're just looking at uh, their perceptions. Yeah, well, and I don't think CAG is. Are they on the, our list of com uh, recognized community groups? They're not on there, are they? I, I don't know. I just I just know they're part of the they're on the website for the uh, the, the PD's website has uh, something that engagement community engagement and they're part of that. But there's no membership. There's no group, and it's got some looks like it's some outdated information. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, Cindy Gus Jensen. Um, a, a couple of bits of information. There are different groups, and they. All three of these may be groups that you do want to engage with in the coming months. Mm -hmm. There's a civilian review board mm -hmm. council um, that's appointed by the mayor, the vice and consent of the council, and uh, council member Johnston has talked about some ideas he has, and other council members have also raised ideas. So I know you'll be talking about that. And we also have a possibility of something in the budget opening that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then there's the Human Rights Commission. And I, I think you were a member of that, Mr. Chair, previously. Yes. And um, one of the goals that that um, commission has had for a long time is to go through and be part of looking at all the city ordinances to try to bring more equity to the city ordinances. And I know there's a lot of talk about that right now. So that's another group that um, you could have come in uh, and then you, and then the um, CAG that uh, Council Member Dugan was just talking about, they are an informal group of people that the chief has uh, invited in periodically. And so we'd have to, you know, check a little bit more on that because they're not a, a regular city board. But um, 
anything that um, the council members would like to do to become more informed about these things, we can do. You could also bring in a group of community council chairs or um, different diverse communities, uh, representatives, that type of a thing. And we um, are keeping that document that I had mentioned to you of um, ideas that council members are having, ideas and questions. And the items that you are raising here tonight and the questions that you're raising, uh, Kira will add to that and then we'll make that um, part of a public discussion so that you can determine uh, how you want to launch into this effort and um, what what pieces you would like to do when, because there's so many ideas, good ideas. I, I would like to, um, one of the last things that I did on the Human Rights Commission was um, we had a, we had some community discussions about the um, Abdi Muhammad shooting. Um, and I would, uh, I would ask the human or ask the administration to, well, no, we can ask because it's a joint board that um, I would like them to come to us with um, some ideas about uh, maybe having community dialogues about what's happened here and what um, over the last couple of days and and see if they if to, to activate that commission that was one of the things we talked about as well um, as a goal for this year so okay and the mayor has joined i don't know if you want to continue the police conversation or if you want to go to the mayor um we want to go to the mayor we need to move on to um to address the other questions that we had listed, like if there were other questions about budget amendment number six. And um, I know that I have questions about the curfew. Um, so uh, Mayor, thanks for joining us. Sorry about, I, we heard you had some technical difficulties, so. It's all right, I'm here. Thanks for uh, making space later in the agenda for this discussion so I could be here. Yeah, can you just talk a little bit about where, what you just came from? Because I know a lot of people yeah. have been writing um, into the council office and saying, you know, what's the plan? What's the mayor's plan? What's the council's plan? Um, and I know you just came from a planning discussion, so. Well, um, I don't, I, it, was a, it was a policy discussion. Or policy discussion. You don't have to give us a plan, but just what are, what are the steps that we're taking so far? Yeah, Chief Brown um, and I reached out to um, a number of leaders and elders in the black community and uh, invited them to come and uh, learn about Salt Lake City Police Department's restraint policy and ask questions. Um, they are police officers um, led by Lieutenant Zayas, um, demonstrated restraint uh, on each other and uh, demonstrated the full extent of that restraint. So what if it's not going well? Um, and we were, we were very lucky to uh, have the attendance of, um, I don't have a list in front of me, but it, it's probably on the news tonight. A number, probably about 10 people were there with us. Um, and then four people came through a Zoom meeting and we're able to ask questions. Well, what if that person, what if they can't breathe? What if they can't breathe in that position? What if they're hard of hearing? What if um, tensions rise? And create a forum to, to see and ask and discuss. Uh, the police department provided uh, written copies of all of the policies um, related to uh, restraint. They also um, talked about uh, implicit bias training, de-escalation training, and the conversation moved also naturally to um, the national conversation. And, and in my perception of the conversation, uh, there was a lot of gratitude from people there, including myself, to see what our police officers uh, do, what that protocol actually looks like, because you sometimes see it on a body camera footage or a video, um, and you don't get the chance to have the officer talk through what it what it is and they expressed uh well, many people expressed gratitude um for the way that our police uh, operate and what is explicitly prohibited in our restraint policies and then um 
talked about, you know, outside of Salt Lake City boundaries, this question came up a couple of times. How do we get to a place where uh, a black man doesn't have to worry or a black woman um, when there's a police car behind theirs and they're not in Salt Lake City and they're in another state, another county, um, and they don't know what that department's policies are? Of course, there weren't um, explicit answers in, in uh, this discussion, but there, uh, there was a question, what, what do you want from us? today and um, I asked two things. One that um, we have this open dialogue because this was a, a unique group of community leaders that I don't think had come together in in this uh, uh, group um, construction together before with the police department. So we said let's let's let this be a beginning of an ongoing conversation that we could come back to any time. But really that as leaders um, that we inspire and encourage our communities to remain engaged for the long haul because this is a huge opportunity for us. And it's about policing, but it's about housing and jobs and education and digital equity and healthcare access and access to capital. It's about it's about everything. So it was a really inspiring time and um I'm glad to have met a couple of people I didn't know before and absolutely glad that so many people who I've I've known for a while and that um, every one of them is a leader in the community that they'd come and participate. So that's what we just did and I, I'll give my thanks to the police department again and to Chief Brown for creating a, a culture in Salt Lake City Police Department that is asking for feedback and um, proud of the work that they do. Want to talk about curfew? Yes. Do you want me to talk about it, or do you want to ask me questions? Or? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I guess I'll start. Is a, a week long curfew necessary? Um, we put in place the week long curfew with the consultation and support of our. Um, sister law enforcement organizations uh, and the support of the governor's office to do so. And that was based on assessment, which is obviously ongoing, and therefore this is iterative um, of the national climate and local intelligence. The protest on Saturday, there was no intelligence leading up to it that uh, led the police to believe it, it would turn violent. And it and it did dramatically so, and so I think that um, I know there's a lot of rumors of intelligence from other agencies and groups outside of Utah, and uh, obviously it's a very sensitive time. Um, but I think it's important for us all to know and for our public to know that we had no indication leading up to 11 a.m. on Saturday that uh, we would be facing the violence that we saw and the destruction we saw. So we take. Um, intelligence very seriously, and we also recognize that things change without any advance warning. Well, Mayor, the sorry. opportunity sorry. to sorry. amend the week long is something, as I said, this is an iterative evaluation, and we are open to amending the length of this if uh, we feel secure in doing so. Can I interrupt you for just a minute about the uh, intelligence on Saturday? Like, um, even though we didn't have any specific intelligence i mean we're always i would imagine the police are always um anticipating that it's possible that there could be you sure know, anytime you have a protest that it could go you know get i don't want to you know that it could turn ugly um and i think that um a lot of what our officers did was trying to prepare for that is that right absolutely and okay. If that even if that preparedness is not visible, which is obviously part of the point of it, um, it was there. I, I think it's also important to know that it wasn't expected that there may be four or five hundred people in attendance, and we know there was well more, maybe triple that on Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. And so the the level of preparedness um, can be uh, overcome by the amount of, of of turnout 
And obviously that's where uh, we couldn't move until we knew our officers would be safe being sent in because they had enough backup, which had to come from other departments. So they are as prepared as they can be for what we can handle as a city. And we're grateful we still have the support of the National Guard and the Highway Patrol and other um, agencies in the county. Um, well, what is having a curfew um, really do? I mean, what if people were going, if people were assembling peacefully and they just wanted to, you know, just stand all night long, um, why, why would, why is that a concern? Well, Chris, as we are, Mr. Chair, as we look across the country, as we look across the country, there's really nothing uh, good that's coming of protests in the middle of the night. And the, the, the ability to incite violence and destruction is uh, a lot easier. And I think if Chief Doubt's still on the line, he'll tell you um, that it's also harder to control in the middle of the night. Um, the security of our streets, but most importantly, our public and our police officers, the property of Salt Lake City as an entirety, you, me, everyone in this city, um, those are our priorities right now. And after seeing the destruction that happened on Saturday night, uh, I'm not ever, I'm not going to let that happen again. And our police department doesn't want that to happen again. So we, we intend to prevent that kind of escalation from happening. And by having the legal authority, and obviously we're not drawing a hard line at 8 PM, depending on the activity of the protest. Um, we need that authority to be able to say it's, it needs to be over now and you need to leave now. Okay, I just, and the reason I'm, you know, kind of pushing on this is just that I've gotten a lot of inform or a lot of texts and calls and inquiries from um, residents who are saying, yeah, this just seems really heavy handed. And like uh, the protest last night seemed to, to go, you know, pretty well. Um, and I, I just am trying to, you know, we obviously don't have all of the information that you do. Um, and so I, I don't know what to um, tell these residents that are, that feel like, um, you know, what they're seeing, I guess maybe doesn't justify this. And they're like, you know, does, what is having, um, you know, Black Hawk helicopters flying around for two hours on a work night? Uh, like, how is that necessary? What justifies that? And I, I can't, you know, other than referring to what happened on Saturday, I, I don't have much more to tell them. Well, uh, if I may, you Thanks. know, you can tell them that those Black Hawk helicopters aren't directed by Salt Lake City. Yeah. We were having protests that went on without any curfew, that went on into the night and into the morning, that Black Hawk helicopters would be flying a lot more than two hours. And the ability for Salt Lake City Police Department to handle the situation as they did last night with the most beautiful professionalism uh you know it's really difficult for them to be in those 70 pound uniforms marching walking following these crowds around and we we had a, a couple dozen almost two dozen officers um many of whom uh passed out from heat exhaustion on saturday night uh it's really hard to to push those protests on and on and on even in the night it's it's warm out there, and uh, so anyway, what I'm what I'm getting at is I appreciate that Salt Lake City was was able to handle the on street work that happened last night. We would be calling. I I have no doubt, and and I'm not the expert. Chief Doubt is, uh, but that we'd be calling in many other departments to come and relieve us to help us cover that kind of ongoing through the middle of the night presence in our streets, and I think. You might be getting more calls from residents who are saying, you know, I got to work in the morning and there's protests going on throughout the middle of the night. Yeah. I'm worried about my property and I'm staying up to watch it. And uh, the cost of that is pretty extreme also. Okay, thank you. I'll share that with them. Um, Assistant Chief Doubt, did you want to, I saw you had your hand up for a minute. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, a, a lot of times, uh, even though that the protest last night was for the most part peaceful, 
we still had officers assaulted. We still had windows of military vehicles smashed out. We still had people carrying guns in that crowd that we arrested later. So it was mostly peaceful, but, uh, and so that's why we have curfews because we, small groups, different small groups that come together become large violent groups very quickly. And so if we can interdict them quickly using the curfew, um, that's why we have a curfew. I'll reiterate, if I can, Mr. Chair, that we would love to see a situation um, of, of peaceful protest um, continuing and not people coming with uh, <clears throat> loaded weapons to these protests, not pe people not firing weapons as we had last night. Um, and, and, you know, if we see that kind of a change um, and, and it's still in assessing the national climate and local intelligence, we would love to not have a curfew. I would love to not have our POU called out every night. You know, we we want to get there. And I think that's why all of you council members and I keep saying to our community, hey, we hear you. We hear you. We want to work. We are ready to work. You know, there's not a switch that needs to get flipped here. We're here. So, um, but I know that the the purpose of the protest is a is a national conversation and I understand that, but Salt Lake City is ready to work. Can I ask, sorry, one more follow-up question? Um, I mean, has the curfew been used um, outright or is the curfew been used as a justification to cancel a protest or a planned protest outright or has it only been used to uh, like limit the time that a protest can go? To my knowledge, and Lisa can correct me, we haven't received an application for an event or anything like that. And obviously with COVID, a lot of that wouldn't happen anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we have the authority to cancel, but we do have the authority to, uh, authority to enforce a curfew. So I guess if someone were scheduling their protest for 8.30 p.m., uh, that the curfew would override, obviously. Yeah, well, I think what I'm getting at is that if people are saying the curfews, uh, I think there are different types of complaints. You know, some complaints are saying, is this heavy handed? Other complaints are saying like, this is, you know, a, a unnecessary restraint on speech. And I'm trying to wonder, or I'm wondering if, um, you know, if this has been used to say, to outright deny any, any speech, um, or if it's being used to, regulate the time in which speech can occur. Well, Chris, I mean, you, I, I know that council members know that the city really vigorously protects people's First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that there are special circumstances in which the time, place, and the manner restrictions are appropriate. And we um, feel confident that in these unprecedented times and given the destruction that was wrecked in our city on Saturday night, that this is an appropriate time, place, and manner um, restriction to have in place. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Councilmember. Can you guess, Jim? If I could add to what Mayor Mendenhall is saying, is looking back at the general times when people do want to hold protests, I, I can't think of a time in Salt Lake City where someone has applied to have a protest after 8 p.m. So the the curfew as it stands now accommodates really historically looking back um, almost all of the protests that that people have uh, submitted uh, requests and permits for. Okay. Um, Councilmember Valdemoros. So I, I've got some um, some thank you, Mayor, for all of that that you've said before. I'm just gonna pass on some a question um, from business owners saying, hey, this curfew kind of affects my business. Is this necessary altogether? And so is there, I, I, I think I know some of the essential businesses that could be open and people could patronize are restaurants. Um, have you had any other complaints or questions or are there any uh, response to this? Um, that you know, this curfew may be affecting negatively negatively affecting businesses. We would uh, welcome that feedback, and I have not directly received 
any, it's difficult to know what businesses would be impacted because people are allowed to go get food. They're allowed to go patronize a private business and there are no restrictions. There are no restrictions on businesses or people getting to businesses. Um, and I spoke with Dee Brewer of the Downtown Alliance this morning, soliciting feedback or criticism from businesses. Uh, they've of course been engaging and haven't really had any. They had a, one comment that they want, uh, they look, a business owner wants downtown to become lively again. And, and of course we all do. And I don't think that was uh, necessarily about the curfew. Um, although obviously things are pretty dampened right now between COVID and this uh, circumstance. But no, we welcome that feedback. And I just wanna be clear, there's no prohibitions on people getting to businesses or patronizing them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other questions on the curfew or um, this briefing is also for budget amendment number six? Uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, did you want to do these together? Um, well, they, they're listed together on our. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. No, they're not. Um, I was uh, sorry. Let's go ahead and go then to budget amendment. I was thinking that the things with, that we discussed, a lot of the things we discussed with Chief Dow were kind of tied into, potentially tied into budget amendment number six, but we can now move to budget member, amendment, amendment number six and address that specifically if there are questions. And there are, um, they are topics of interest to the administration significantly. So the mayor may want to chime in, but I'll I'll quickly go over. There are two items that are um, pending from the other night. Um, one actually is a new item that's a council added item, mm -hmm. and that is um, funding. And this is in collaboration with the administration. It is wrapping up uh, year end funding for uh, public safety. Uh, including fire, police, dispatch, and then also uh, public services. There have been a number of things recently, and even I would say throughout the year, that have impacted the department's ability to absorb expenses. Uh, going clear back to the United Nations Conference, the um, police department was heavily impacted by that. They received partial reimbursement for their overtime but not complete reimbursements. So that that um, makes it more difficult on them to absorb their overtime. So um, then you have, of course, COVID, the earthquake and, and the protests. So uh, the administration has uh, identified for us that there is uh, $988,000 in funding that uh, they're projecting that through year end. And that would um, address all of those um, uh, departments, public safety, public services um, functions. And it, it would allow those departments then to, to finish the, the budget year in, in the black. Uh, because it's a combination of expenses, there, um, what we were suggesting is that that go into the non-departmental account that is managed by finance so that um, they can uh, work with each department to see what expenses are, are uh, relevant for this purpose and which ones are not. And um, so that, that's the first part of this, this issue of some additional funding. There are a couple of other issues that council members have raised in this conversation and in the past several days. Um, one of them is the training that you have talked about. Uh, the, the council has previously provided a lot of the training funding for, the, for implicit bias, uh, for equitable policing, and for um, de-escalation techniques. Those, um, there are other trainings out there that we could work with the police department and the administration on and uh, we would have to come back to you with a, with a number on number one, what, it would, what would it take to get um, just the training in general, 
but then what would it take to make it more effective and get the, the whole police force through that training uh, in a shorter time period? And so, so we can come back to you with that, that number. Um, if I were to guess, uh, based on the numbers that uh, Ben from our staff has provided so far, I think it's probably around $300,000 if you want to provide uh, some overtime expense to help expedite that. Uh, we've uh, helped facilitate training for even as little as $50,000. So, so you don't have to um, make any decisions on this tonight. It is scheduled as part of budget amendment number six, which will be voted on next week. Uh, another issue that was raised that, that could go in a category of funds like this with non-departmental is uh, the issue of uh, the civilian review board that has been raised by council members. Um, there is an interest in having some conversations about whether there are tools or training uh, or any type of um, additional um, services that that board could use to fulfill the, the role that they have been asked to fulfill in general, uh, plus at this time um, of, uh, of desire to, to do more, more thorough reviews. So um, for the training and for the civilian review, if you choose to fund those, those we could put into a holding account and then you could ask for the administration to come back to you with their recommendations and then um, ask the civilian review board directly um, what what it is they would need and ask their um, administrative staff member. And just to clarify, sometimes um, people think that that board uh, reports or their staff reports to the police department and actually they are uh, removed from the police department, their staff person reports to human resources so that there's some distance between that, um, that staffing and that investigation and the board staffing uh, some distance from the police department. So, uh, and I know council members have specific ideas about that. So mm -hmm. just be thinking about whether you would like to have um, some funding set aside for training and for um, the civilian review board. Then the other new category, it's not a new category, but the finishing up from the other day, the housing category, um, you uh, took a straw poll uh, to say that you wanted to use funding other than the um, loan funding. And so what, what we did is looked at, there are five or six um, different potential sources council members didn't express a preference. So what we did is identified the most flexible option, one that preserves the most, most options for you going forward, and that is to use fund balance as a bridge. So this would not be your ultimate source, but it would be the bridge that would allow the administration to deploy that money right away um, because they are, are prepared to do this. So uh, they, it's my understanding that they would appreciate it if you felt comfortable voting tonight on that um, so that they could, could get it out as, as soon as the uh, mayor's office, attorney's office, finance certifies that they have the contracts in place and, and that type of thing. So, um, so you could do that right away um, and then come back around once we have more information about the COVID funding and about um, how you'd like to balance the general fund budget. You have four or five uh, sort of moving targets in terms of, of uh, appropriation resources. So once we know um, more about what you'd like to do, then you can, can change up the source in the budget opening. And um, then, oh, I should say, one of the things that you talked about the other day on the um, housing money was that you wanted to know about criteria and and how the funds would be managed by the departments or by the agencies, the, the community partner agencies. 
uh, we didn't receive that until today. And it came in the form of uh, what they refer to as guideposts. And you would have received that this afternoon in email. Um, we don't have a motion proposed for you or some options because we just didn't didn't have time. So, so um, you could either appropriate these funds with um, without any um, criteria or contingent parts of the motion, or you could spend some time discussing tonight what whether you're comfortable with the criteria that was um, suggested by the administration. Um, you could even approve it conditionally tonight with uh, criteria to be confirmed on on Thursday or something if if um, if you wanted to spend more time than you have tonight. So that can be moved forward tonight. Question is just whether um, you want to spend some more time on uh, talking about the criteria. The administration is prepared uh, to show you a couple of slides and share some information if you would like to talk about it further. Um, council members, do you want to weigh in on if you wanted to have a further discussion on this or are you sat if you're satisfied with the information that we've been given? Sure. I haven't had just time to actually look at the uh, email yet, but I'm a fr I'm fine appropriating the money as long as we're able to come back and talk and discuss the actual programs. Okay. I agree with James. I haven't had time in the email to look at the guideposts, but um, I I would like to appropriate the money from the source that Cindy mentioned that can be deployed as soon as we move forward on that with. Um, so for the mayor and um, Rachel, would that, would it be helpful to have a straw poll to that effect or what additional guidance do you need? Are you hoping to gain from tonight? Uh, mayor, would you like me to speak to that or would you like to? Okay. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just want to say thanks to the council again for being willing to travel down this road with us. I know that our interests are aligned and that we get money out quickly to residents who need it as as we are kind of facing another deadline or another kind of cliff and where people are getting their resources. So thank you for this. Thanks for the discussion. I just want to clarify that, um, first of all, yes, I think a straw poll would be helpful. And then if you're willing, and then second, that there's, a, there's still a lot of opportunity for us to have the conversation around the kinds of parameters that we're hoping to um, enter into with our partners, our community partners here. Not, none of that is has been decided. Um, we're happy to, after you've had time to digest it, I don't know if it needs to be, you know, any kind of even a formal conversation, um, but it can be if whatever you, whatever you desire, but we're, we're anxious to get your feedback on, you know, what AMI you'd like to target, um, what levels of assistance, you know, are important to you and, and how we can partner best with our community organizations around these programs. So I just want to make sure that that's, that's been clear in this conversation. And I know Lonnie is prepared to talk about the details, but if that isn't something you want to spend time on tonight, um, we certainly understand that too. And thanks for your patience as we've gotten this program together over the last few weeks. Okay. And um, thank you, Rachel. Do you need more um, with the kind of straw poll, like what um, well, Council, Council Member Rogers didn't actually make a straw poll, but um, would what he said be sufficient if that were a straw poll? For tonight's let, purposes? Let me sneak in um, so that Rachel doesn't have to answer that in two different ways. One is that um, you do have it on your agenda later. So you have a public hearing tonight right. and you have the opportunity to vote on it. So you could do the straw poll and that, or you could just do the straw poll. Um, council members, I'm, I would, James, uh, excuse me, council member Rogers, I'm looking for a straw poll. Uh, I, well, let me think now. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I make a straw poll that we approve the, uh, 
the, the uh, funding of the programs depending on or put a bunny, the money aside for the programs, but we've uh, come back and discussed the guideposts and the actual uh, policy behind it discussion. Does that help Does that make it work? Yeah, so council members, if you'll just indicate your support um, so that I can read that off or actually, is there any discussion, any further discussion? I have clarification. So this is the funding for just the specific programs we've been talking about today or the whole entirety of Budget Amendment 6? This, uh, yes. this is not Budget Amendment 6. It's part of Budget Amendment number 6. The bulk of Budget Amendment number 6 is on for decision next Tuesday. Okay. What this is is the, the the housing stability program, getting that um, out into the community sooner rather than having it yeah, having it. Yeah, so it's the housing parts of budget amendment number six. Okay, any other discussion to this? Okay, if you'll just indicate your support. I see council member Rogers is supportive, council member Dugan supportive, um, Fowler, Valdemoros, Johnston, Mono. Um, are all supportive and I'm supportive as well. So there, it's a unanimous straw poll of support. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Um, any other um, items that we need to run through before we um, go on our break? Um, Lonnie, thanks for being available, even though we ended up not going through those slides, by the way, but thank you for being here. And Mr. Chair, I believe you have the interview of. Oh, that's right. Whoops. Just that. That little, that little matter. Okay. Um, sorry. Last item is um, our interview um, advising consent for um, the mayor's um, um, nominee appointee um, for the vacancy in the office of the city recorder, Cindy Lou Trishman, who we all know and love. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Cindy Lou, do you want to um, start by, you know, telling us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> and uh, why you're interested in this position. Did she answer that 20 question uh, survey? Um, I, I hope, I, I'm not sure. Uh, if, if she did, I hope those results were distributed to somebody because I didn't get them. Um, well, and actually, I mean, Mayor, do you want to start? Do you want to do an introduction or Katie and then turn it over to Cindy Lou? I, I'd love to do a little introduction of sorts mm -hmm. that it's not often that we get to put someone that we know and we trust and who we've seen under pressure um, in the public realm, handling meetings, making sure that democracy is done the way it's supposed to be done. And we have years of experience with Cindy Lou, um, firsthand experience, knowing how she conducts herself and how uh, how highly she regards um, the public's work being done in the most transparent and accountable way. And that is the job of the city recorder to a T. So it's, uh, it's with such great pleasure and confidence that I bring to you Cindy Lou Trishman for hopefully your uh, advice and consent to go well with. Thank you. Katie, would you like to say anything as uh, as the city attorney works very closely with the city recorder and they're um, technically the part of the same office? Do you want to speak to that? Ab absolutely. We had an impressive panel of applicants for this position and Cindy Lou rose to the top uh, with her professionalism and her demeanor and her leadership ability, ability. And I'd say she is a true public servant and I am so thrilled to work in collaboration with her to uh, bring the recorder's office um, into the next era, working in collaboration with the council and the mayor's office. So I, I couldn't be more pleased with the mayor's appointment today. And, and I just can't wait to start working with Cindy Liu. Okay, Cindy Liu, do you wanna make a 
statement or go back to my previous questions, telling us a little about yourself, why you're interested? Well, I am just so thrilled with the opportunity that I've been given to look to move in this direction. So the council office has given me such incredible experience that I will only take with me and will continue to grow with the council and the mayor. So I look forward to this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I'll just say that um, you know, Cindy Lou was one of, uh, well, both Cindy's were, were the first two um, council staff that I interacted with when um, uh, after in that period when you won the election, but you haven't been sworn in yet. And um, I have always been so impressed um, with, uh, with Cindy Lou and the, uh, how accommodating and friendly and um, thorough and just um, hyper competent that you were to, uh, to bring um, me and the other people, Amy Fowler, who was elected at the same time, bringing us on board. Um, and I have seen you handle some, you know, very difficult um, projects in the in the council office, and was, you know, really delighted when you. I heard that you were interested in the position, even though I'm. It it's um, will be a huge loss to our uh, to the council staff um, and but I I have every confidence that you will um, really excel at this job and in particular I'm excited about uh, the your um, um, like technical abilities and being able to uh, bring those to bear and it help advance our reporter's office so um, thank you very much and you have my full support and i'm um, just sorry that you won't won't we won't get to see you on uh, more of a regular basis but hopefully hopefully you'll still come down for a good portion of those meetings i know you will thank you i've had my supporters here coming yes. to make <laughs> sure that you know they're behind me yeah. <laughs> literally yeah. and figuratively yes <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, Council member. Oh, also Cindy Lou is a district three resident. So just showing you that there's another awesome D3 resident. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Council member Valdemoros. Well, Cindy, I just wanted to say that um, I'm so proud of you. I remember when we worked in the planning division a long time ago and, and how much you've accomplished and where you're going. I, I don't doubt that you're going to be awesome. Um, to be honest with you, when we found out, a lot of us said, can we say no to this, <laughs> her leaving us? Um, but no, of course, of course, we're, I'm super excited that where you're going. Um, one thing I'm gonna start thinking, I'm gonna start taking this personal. You left me when I was in the planning division <laughs> and now you're leaving me again when I'm at the council office. Just saying, mm -hmm. no, good luck. Uh, you'll do great. Congrats. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to speak to Councilmember Fowler? James can go first. Councilmember Rogers. Oh, I was just going to say congratulations. I was still, I'm going to say no, you know, no matter what, because I feel like I have to, because <laughs> I'm so loyal as a honey badger, you know, I got to protect my people. So congratulations. Thank you very much. I thought you were a panther. Isn't that what we have to go over every meeting? Well, you know, you're all, once a panther, always a panther, but you know, a honey badger is a little bit stronger than a panther, so it's a little bit beyond a panther. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else want to speak to this? Councilmember Fowler. Um, so congratulations, Cindy Lou. I'm very excited for you as much as I am really going to miss you. And I just, I really want to just give you my sincerest thanks for always being there um, and reading my mind and knowing what I need before I know that I need it. Um, and, you know, 
Chris made a comment that you he's seen you handle very difficult projects. And I think um, <laughs> my first thought was, yeah, probably the most difficult is handling me. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and you do that with a lot of grace, and I appreciate that. But joking aside, um, last year was, as RDA chair, we, we went through quite a bit and we saw we saw protests in our council meetings and um i was in i remember this one day just being so incredibly stressed that i couldn't breathe and i walked back into my my little cubicle and cindy lou just came back she had some kleenex for me and a cup of coffee and was just like okay we're gonna breathe now do you like can i get you anything else with the most calm demeanor and voice that I was like, okay, I, I can do this. We're going to get through this. And I don't know that you know how impactful that really is, um, at least for me. And I can guess for a lot of other people that get put in some pretty stressful moments that, that you just bring us down to this more calm level. And so thank you. I look forward to watching you do great work with our recorder's office and probably continuously nag me to sign the things that you sent me on emails because I'll forget to do it. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to work with you all. I can say that with confidence. It's been wonderful and we'll continue to work together. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Do do we need to take a straw poll on our? Okay, great. Um, all right. Thanks so much, um, everybody. We'll go ahead and break now and reconvene um, in a separate meeting for the formal at seven o'clock. And it could be a late one, so be be all ready to go. Okay, thanks. Now I have to get my own coffee. <laughs> <laughs>